second April 22nd uh, meeting, Earth Day. Um, today we have a full agenda. Um, first, I'd like to, if you're here to testify for the short-term rentals, please fill out a card in the back and mark the card short-term rentals so Julie, and bring it up to Julie so she can know if you're here for the short-term rentals. If you're for, here for anything else on recap six, mark it, just recap six and bring it to Julie. We will have two sets of hearings in terms of testimony. We'll have everything but short-term rentals first. And second, we will have the short-term rentals. Tonight, because of what we're expecting is a full capacity, we will only allow two minutes of testimony and we'll be very strict about the two minutes of testimony tonight. Our order of business tonight is uh, called order items of interest from the commissioners, consent agenda, consideration of minutes from our 4-8-14 meeting, and recap six with Sandra Wood and Morgan Tracy. Um, items of interest from the commissioners. You're interesting, say something interesting. <laughs> No, um, just one thing from my, myself um, on April 25th, this Friday at City Club, I'll be in a panel discussion about gentrification and solutions for gentrification. Susan? Very brief director's report. Just to mention that, um, as you know, we had talked about um, having one of our new members of the two vacancies be a youth member. We had way more than a dozen, so close to 20 applications. We did two rounds of interviews um, because there were so many good applicants. Um, the, the applicants were from age 18 to 25, and um, we've chosen someone. Her name is Margaret Talmadge, and I will ask her to come to the next meeting to introduce herself, but it'll probably be the June meeting before actually uh, being appointed. And then we'll try and do the other appointment at the same time. So the mayor is considering some names. We have probably another 20 applications in for the other uh, position. Great. Thank you. Nice. Consent agenda, consideration of minutes from 4814. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Moves in second discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Passes. Uh, recap six. Sandra and Morgan. Thank you, Andre. Uh, good evening and happy Earth Day. I'm Morgan Tracy the, with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability and Project Manager for RECAP 6. Uh, tonight in the audience, I'm joined by our staff from our co-development team. Uh, and you'll be seeing many of them uh, in the second part of our hearing tonight. Uh, we've also been closely collaborating with our partners with Development Services. So I have Kristen Cooper here tonight from BDS to get into any of the implementation type questions. Uh, so tonight's agenda, as you mentioned, is going to be a little different. Uh, based on the amount of public interest on the short-term rental topic, we're asking the Commission to review parts of the package that did not generate the same level of public interest first. I will start with a quick presentation, followed by public testimony on those items, and then the Commission will deliberate and vote on those items. And then Sandra will come up and uh, give you a quick review from your April 8th briefing on the short-term rental proposal. We'll hear from the public and take a separate vote for that topic. As you do, will you call out the items? here so we can refer to them? Well, we'll, we'll work our way through the items. Okay. Uh, we're going to focus primarily on the minor policy items and, and okay. deal with the others sort of in a batch. So uh, as you recall from your briefing on April 8th, we've had considerable public outreach. We had a seven-week review period on the discussion draft, during which time we, we sent over a thousand notices to individuals and organizations. We met with neighborhood district coalitions and associations. We've briefed this commission, the Historic Landmarks Commission and Design Commission. We held a very well attended open house, not as well attended as this. <laughs> uh, we spent over two hours talking about the short term rental topic, and we heard a wide variety of viewpoints. Recap six covers three categories of amendments. So if you're following along in your summary sheet, this document is sort of two pager, and for the audience, it opens up like that. Uh, you will see we cover minor policy items, clarification items, and a set of items where no changes are being proposed. So I'd like to start off with the minor policy items. I'm going to spend just a few minutes covering these six minor policy topics. Sandra will talk you through the short-term rental item later this evening. 
Uh, minor policy items are those where there is or there could be a change from the original policy intent when the provision was initially adopted. They modify existing policy rather than create new policy. And these minor changes can be initiated to react to state or federal legislation, address evolving needs, or respond to innovation in development or technology. This first item responds to the Telecommunications Act and other federal law. So the recap proposal is addressing uh, radio frequency facilities, also known as cell towers. And it replaces distinctions between types of wireless providers, which are currently based on effective radiated power, or uh, RF emissions, and instead defines two broad classes of wireless facilities, personal wireless services, which is like smartphones, and radio TV broadcast facilities, which are like the big towers up on the hill. It replaces the city's radio frequency emission standards with a requirement to certify compliance with the Federal Communications Commission standards. And it allows limited modification of existing facilities without a conditional use review, provided they generally adhere to the original facility's design or screening requirements. After publishing the proposed draft, staff found that the allowed modifications did not go far enough to comport with federal law. This section is part 47 of the US Code. It's now been codified in section 1455. It says, a state or local government may not deny and shall approve any eligible facilities request for a modification of an existing wireless tower or base station that does not substantially change the physical dimensions of such tower or base station. In essence, this requires local governments to approve changes to existing wireless towers to encourage co-location. Staff evaluated several options to allow modest increases to tower height, but found no good solutions. Furthermore, it was not clear that any of these options would meet the federal requirement. Due in part to the vagaries of the federal legislation, the Federal Communication Commission is currently in the process of developing rules to clarify the intent and reach of this requirement. That rulemaking process is not complete and we don't expect an answer before late fall. Therefore, rather than choose a threshold for tower height increases that may conflict with that federal requirement, we are instead pointing our regulations to the federal law. I uh, draw your attention to the staff memo dated April 22nd. We've drafted language, which is included in your packet. We've drafted language which borrows language from the federal regulation. And in its essence, this change allows towers to increase their height consistent with federal requirements now and as clarified by future rulemaking, but also includes a provision that the carrier must demonstrate that the requested increase in tower height is the minimum needed to avoid interference with existing antennas. I apologize for all the technical background on this particular item. This is kind of the, the situation the federal government has left us in. The next minor policy item addresses several changes to the temporary activities chapter. First, we restructured the chapter and organized the regulations by activity as opposed to by zone. We clarified that temporary warming and cooling centers may be operated during periods of natural emergencies and inclement weather. We added regulations to allow temporary filming and we expanded regulations for off-site construction staging, which is currently applicable only to public projects, extended those, those allowances to private construction projects in certain areas with higher development intensity anticipated. We also clarified the time limits for each of those activities. The Multnomah County Drainage District requested that the city evaluate the requirement for environmental review for certain restoration projects within its jurisdiction. This proposed change takes development standards that were crafted for bank restoration activities as part of the airport plan district and extends them to other areas of the Columbia Slough to avoid the need for a more costly and lengthy environmental review process. And I think you just received a letter in support from MCDD. Revocable permits. These are a legacy of, of the past. Prior to 1991, the city could grant a permit for a use or development that did not conform to the zoning regulations, for instance, a commercial use in a residential zone. Some of these permits are still on the books and they're still in effect, but they become void when the ownership changes. So this particular amendment creates a mechanism to allow revocable permits to be transferred to new owners and continue on like other non-conforming or grandfathered rights. In commercial zones outside the central city, in cases where an applicant opts to use public art in lieu of meeting the ground floor window requirement, this particular change removes the need to go through a second approval process for art that has already been approved by the Regional Arts and Culture Council. And finally, 
This minor policy item addresses when the zoning code applies to development in the public right-of-way. Generally, the zoning code only applies to public rights-of-way in a few select situations, scenic, design, and natural resource overlay areas. When the code was amended in 1996 to separate historic review from design review, the section describing the applicability of those requirements to the, to the right-of-way was not amended to reference this new chapter. This amendment will correct that oversight. So I mentioned earlier, going back to the two-page summary of the recap items, on the insight right-hand page is the list of the 20 clarification items. So Howard, if you have a particular question or if the commission has a particular question about any of the clarification items, uh, we can discuss those now or we can wait until after the, the testimony and, and come back and answer questions. But these amendments essentially resolve technical errors, make co code language more consistent, or clarify the regulations to ensure the outcome is consistent with the original policy intent. Down on the bottom there, bottom left, we have a set of non-amendments. Uh, these items were issues that were identified in our work plan that staff investigated, evaluated, and ultimately concluded did not warrant a code fix. The reasons for not recommending an amendment could be because the existing policy is sound and should not be changed. The change requires additional or specialized resources to develop a solid proposal. Or the regulations are achieving the desired result. And here again, unless there are questions now in the interest of time, I suggest we wait and hear, for, wait and hear the public testimony. For this first portion of the hearing, after you've heard relevant public testimony, we are asking you to take actions on the items contained within Recap 6, with the exception of the items related to the short-term rentals. This slide includes staff's recommendation and suggested motion language, including the amended language for RF facilities that I introduced tonight. Uh, and staff is available for any questions now, or we can come back. Thank you. Testimony? Any questions of staff now? Uh, we have two people that are testifying, Ken Leon and um, Joan Sterick. Um, if you can come up and you have two minutes. That will be enough. Thank you. And uh, just to be clear on the short-term rentals, if you, Joan, if you can hold off on your testimony and I'll call you back up for the short-term rentals. Is, is that okay? So you can just testify about the other recap items now. And then I'll call you back up for the short term rentals later. Set aside the short term rentals. Because it said you're testifying on both items. So are you not? Okay. Ken? Hi, my name is uh, Ken Lyons on behalf of AT&T. I handle local jurisdictional relations in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, a couple of things I just want to mention. I want to thank staff, uh, particularly the Bureau of Development Services and Bureau of Planning Sustainability for, and the, of course the Commission for all the work that's been put in on this, uh, uh, this amendment to the wireless uh, uh, regulations. Uh, you know, it's a fairly complex topic. There's been a lot of changes, uh, obviously not just LUBA decisions, but also uh, uh, to state, I'm not state, but uh, federal law in a couple of different places. We realize it can be a complex topic. We appreciate staff's willingness to listen and the commission's willingness to listen and to kind of work through these issues. And uh, I'm just going to state very short, I know that you have a lot of people behind me, but I'll just say this. Uh, we're not going to suggest any changes tonight, um, and I think we support uh, the code change as, as it's been amended uh, or suggested to be amended by staff. Um, obviously, we would prefer that some provisions be perhaps worded differently and perhaps in different language uh, to, to better reflect uh, federal law. But um, by and large, we realize that there's a balance that had to be struck uh, with how the city was uh, interpreting uh, the information that's come down from not just the LUBA decision, but also uh, federal law. And we appreciate the, the fact that the balance that they were trying to strike. And uh, to that extent, we support the concepts that are inside uh, in the draft uh, language. And so again, we uh, do support it. Um, and uh, I'll leave my comments there. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, just a quick question. Are you suggesting that we are not in compliance with federal law? 
Uh, me? No, or? well, AT&T. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think that uh, obviously the, uh, I think the city recognizes and, and the reason why I think that uh, the wireless amendment was uh, put forth is that there are uh, there have been three things that have changed. There's a, a state, uh, there's a LUBA decision that dealt with uh, the ability of the city to uh, have its own separate RF standards. Um, that was one issue. The second topic was uh, there's a, a, the 1996 Telecom Act that talks about um, how uh, facilities uh, cannot be regulated on the basis of missions. And then the third uh, change was the recent change in federal law, uh, Section 6409 of the Middle Class Tax Act, which um, Morgan Tra Tracy mentioned in his testimony, which is uh, effectively uh, talks about modifications of existing sites. So most of the changes that, uh, if not all of them, but pretty much most of the changes to the, uh, uh, the wireless regulations deal with not changes to new facilities. It deals with changes to modifications to existing sites. The sites already exist, and, and that's what the, the main issues were. But yeah, there were a couple of uh, provisions within the existing code that were inconsistent with that, and I think that's why um, this, uh, these amendments okay. were proposed. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, is there any other testimony on any other item in recap six other than short-term rentals at this point? Come on up. You, you're not uh, on short-term rentals. Okay. Kathy? Yeah. Give it to Julie. Sorry, I'm late. Traffic is terrible, as you know. <laughs> Glad you made it. You have two minutes for your testimony. Oh my God. <laughs> doesn't count, doesn't count until I start. <laughs> okay, so my name is Kathy First Now, and um, I live at 4930 Northeast 73rd. And um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to the Planning Commission. I want to talk about um, basically the wireless technology. And um, I did submit testimony um, last week, and then I also have copies here. So I know that the FCC regulates what can and cannot be done to a, a large extent. But one of the things that I was happy to see was regarding the noise from the utility cabinets um, that are placed for the um, attendant equipment. And um, I've been working with uh, noise officer uh, Paul Van Orden. And he indicated that many times these accessory equipments are much noisier than what city code allows, and that he would um, like to see that the equipment meets code standards before they are installed. And so I am happy to see that there is language addressing that, that accessory equipment um, located in or within 50 feet of an R zone must document in advance that the facility will meet noise regulations in Chapter 33.262 offsite impacts. But I would ask that additional language be added to clarify that the documentation should be submitted by a certified acoustical engineer. Um, on April 3rd, Douglas Hardy from the Bureau of Development Services rendered a decision that had um, this conditional use permit part of that application in that an acoustical engineer report demonstrating that noise levels from the cooling units are in compliance was part of that approval. So I'm hoping that just that little sentence of um, a certified acoustical engineer um, be added to that because otherwise it wouldn't be um, the same consistent from application to application depending on who's looking at the noise requirement. And so, do I still have a little bit of time? The other thing I would like to talk about. Um, no? OK. Give us your last thought. Oh, my quick. last thought was in terms of the, di um, the diameters, like in the public right of way. I know that FCC says, well, you can't really um, <clears throat> say how large or how wide things are. But at some point, when you get to be 10, 15 feet wide, um, it's a safety and uh, visually uh, concerning in that for pedestrians and cars, if you can't see around these these units. So I would like to see something where it kind of puts some kind of limits on that. So, but basically, it's just a certified acoustical engineer is what I'd like to see added. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Questions? Yeah, under a quick one. Don, <laughs> Kathy, on the, on the noise acoustical engineers report, mm -hmm. typically uh, all the equipment that goes along with, with this type of facility 
would have a kind of an engineer's cut sheet along with it that would basically document and describe how much noise the machine makes. If that was submitted, would that be an acceptable solution from your perspective? Well, um, I'm not the expert on that, like uh, Paul Van Orden would be the expert on that, and, and, and he says that a lot of times it might be that way, but then in actuality, the noise is much louder, especially when you have several cooling units running at the same time in the yeah. warmer. You know, you have one that's running at this, and then if you have double, because a lot of times you have more than one um, during the warmer weather, it would be, you know, exceeding the 60 decibels. Okay, 60. Yeah, it's 55 nighttime, but it's, um, it's 60 over during 60 the, uh, is the peak upper. heat. Yeah. yeah, well, 60 or more, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other testimony on anything other than short-term rentals for recap six? With that, I'm closing the testimony for all items other than short-term rentals. Morgan, you want to come back up? <clears throat> so questions for Morgan? Mike? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yes. I, I think noise is a very underappreciated impact on quality of life in the city. And I'd, I'd like to hear whether Mr. Van Orden He's in Oni now, right? Correct. Um, whether you've had any communications with him and whether this represents a significant issue in your mind with regard to what you're proposing, because I, I would like to see something nailed down on the. So uh, the proposed language that was added uh, addressing the, the need to document conformance with the noise impacts was at um, the, our noise officer's recommendation. We added that language, the, the suggestion to add um, qualifications that the documentation be by a certified acoustical engineer is perfectly sound, at least uh, gives some, some good um, consistent basis between, between those documents. So I don't have an objection to that, that suggestion. Um, uh, Paul Van Orden did identify that these were really more of an issue in, in and near residential areas um, at nighttime. And they all also are subject to a slightly different uh, acoustical standard than other noise generating things because they have sort of a, a constant tonal attribute that, that affects how they're, they're measured. So um, he, he recognized that there was a, an issue there and that sort of coming in the field after the fact to mitigate those noise impacts was often resulting in um, uh, either a costly solution uh, or it made the, the equipment um, there was no way to make the equipment conform, um, or it would possibly trigger another review for design uh, compatibility. So I, I think the, the, the proposed regulation is good. The suggestion to add an acoustical engineer is a, is a good suggestion. Other questions? Don? Uh, I agree with adding the language, uh, Mike. I agree with you on the background noise that these make. And actually, there's a utility event in my neighborhood, and it's noisy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, I think Kathy makes a good point. A lot of these are in residential areas throughout the city. And I think, Morgan, it, it, putting the language in is good. Now, as part of our motion, can we direct Morgan to, to insert language that relates to this? Yeah. Once we get done with our comments, okay. we're going to move to uh, talking about um, motions and amendments. Chris? So Morgan, I saw in the written testimony um, there was a letter from Bonnie McKnight that raised several points about things other than short-term rentals. Um, are you in a position to briefly address those? Yeah, Bonnie usually raises good points. Yeah. Could you run us through those points? Well, unfortunately, it won't come up on my tablet at the oh. moment, so I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then I'll have to uh, recall from my, my uh, memory, which has been a little uh, I, I uh, iffy. I have them here if you want them. Great. You want them? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Bonnie will appreciate this. Uh, Ms. McKnight r raises an issue related to the environmental zone development standards that we developed for MCDD and suggested that we add a provision um, seeking to uh, get ongoing maintenance included as part of those standards to ensure that the plantings that are planted are replaced if they die. Um, that language or similar language already exists in our landscaping standards chapter uh, for um, both landscaping and for restoration plantings. So for that particular topic, um, the addition of that language would not be necessary. 
she suggested for the public art for ground floor windows that um, there should be an aspect of neighborhood association review and acceptance before the change is implemented in a specific area. We talked to RAC about their process. They include equity goals. Um, they also uh, notify neighborhood associations of their um, of those proposals when they come through, and they're not very frequent, but um, they are. The neighborhoods are involved in those decisions. Um, she also made no mention about the the we we had clarified regulations about um, how setbacks are applied to mechanical units placed on the ground, and the fact that they are not allowed to project into the setbacks. They're not considered a minor projection. They're considered a structure that has to stay out of, outside of the setbacks. Her concern, and I think we heard some comments from the building industry, was there, there may be some element or some reason to have uh, mechanical equipment that, that is allowed to intrude in the setback. Um, to, uh, what her point is for um, processing used water or other energy saving features, uh, other energy saving um, mechanical equipment. We do have a process in the in the zoning code. It's a land use adjustment process for those types of situations that are um, sort of one-offs or a little unique situation. So there is a there is an avenue for regulatory relief if people want to pursue it. it granted, it does take a review, but uh, again, by and large, uh, the expectation is mechanical equipment are uh, intended to be outside of those setback areas. Um, she. Uh, supported the, the changes to the land division approval criteria for potential landslide hazard areas. Um, she suggested the importance of clarifying the when there's a change between conditional uses within a conditional use category. So again, that was a, a statement of support. Uh, and the last item uh, speaks to the land use review comment period. And essentially what we, we had a few items in our, in our work plan that dealt with comment periods, appeal decision times, and notification requirements. And the comment that we heard both in our outreach and um, in testimony was there's a desire from the neighborhoods to have more time to consider land use reviews. And we, we sort of have a, a little bit of a double-edged sword there because we have different um, types of processes with different timelines associated with them. The smaller process, a type one, has a, has a very limited amount of public uh, comment period is 14 days. The uh, extends to 21 days for type two and and longer for type three, where there's a public hearing involved. So the amount of time given for public testimony is sort of a function of a the city's need to process the applications in a timely manner, and b that we're up against the state mandated 120 day rule. So that sort of constrains us on both sides. So there wasn't much much wiggle room there. Okay, thank you for running through those. Other questions. Michelle? On, on the RF, just to get this straight in my head. So we're talking about you're allowed to do um, modifications that don't substantially change the physical dimensions of the tower pursuant to that federal code. So how does that interrelate with the requirement to get an acoustical engineer? If you're allowed to modify? There, there's sort of a, there, there's, so that provision establishes a threshold for when you need to go through a conditional use review and when you just go for a building permit. In both cases, for any kind of um, change to your accessory equipment, new equipment, or replacing or adding equipment, you would still need to demonstrate that the equipment met this acoustical standard. Other questions? No? OK. Um, do I hear any amendments um, to um, recap six for anything else? Okay, um, I'm going to make a motion, and, and as part okay. of my motion, a mo a motion yeah, I uh, suggest uh, uh, one amendment. Okay. Uh, the motion is to approve recap six with the exception of items 12 through 14, short term rentals, uh, as follows. And I'm referring to an image that's up on our screen right now. It has three bullet points underneath it. The third bullet point is direct staff to refine recommended code language and commentary as necessary. Within that third bullet, I would recommend that we address the acoustical engineer's report. Uh, we heard testimony tonight from, from uh, Kathy Firstenau, and she, she put in language, at the time of building permit, the applicant must submit a signed and stamped acoustical engineering report demonstrating compliance with noise level. So I would suggest that staff uh, incorporate language that reflects that, uh, that opinion, okay? Is there a second? Thank you. So moved and seconded. Discussion? Julie, vote. Gray? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Kraut? 
Aye. It passed. Um, first part of recap six is passed. So that's it. We go home. <laughs> <laughs> no? See you guys later. <laughs> yeah, we're done. <laughs> Sandra. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'm Sandra Wood with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And I'm here to summarize um, our proposal for the accessory short-term rentals. Um, as you recall, I was here two weeks ago with a couple of my colleagues um, giving a full description of the proposal. What I'm hoping to do today is to just quickly go through um, the full proposal and, um, and then we can get into um, public testimony. And I suspect there are people, members of the public who haven't been with us in the discussion. So um, I'm hoping this will give them um, enough information to be able to actively participate in, in the testimony. Um, after we take public testimony, I'll be joined by Julia Giesler, the project planner on, on this aspect of RECAP 6, and Mike Liefeld, who um, is with Bureau of Development Services, which is the bureau that will administrate the program and, 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 and do enforcement. Um, we also have Terry Williams here from the Revenue Bureau. You heard from her last time about the transient lodging taxes. And we have invited also Uma Krishnan, who um, is the Bureau of Planning Sustainability's demographer and housing policy analyst. Um, in case we have questions for, for either one of them and we need their expertise. Um, so just getting right to it, um, you'll recognize most of these slides. Um, so let's start with defining rental types. There are two types of rentals in Portland, um, long-term rentals and short-term rentals. Long-term we define as more than 30 days and that would be a regular lease that you're assigning with the landlord for um, for a house, let's say, for a full year lease agreement. Short-term rentals are where the lease is for less than a monthly basis or on a nightly basis. We are not talking about long-term today. We're talking about short-term um, in this project. In particular, we're focusing on internet sites and the emerging trend of peer-to-peer -peer rentals where internet sites make it possible to connect people who want to rent their space with people who are looking for a place to stay. Um, these peer-to-peer um, rentals are currently regulated through the bed and breakfast facilities chapter of the zoning code and what that requires is a type 2 conditional use review which is a land use review um, takes a substantial amount of time 8 to 10 weeks and and cost um, and cost to the applicant um, right now um, we looked at some numbers and since 2004 we the city has approved 24 conditional use reviews for bed and breakfast facilities so that's in contrast to the well over 1,000 um, short-term rentals that we know are taking place through um, uh, um, kind of under the radar in the informal market. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, getting back to our handy-dandy slide here, um, we have the short-term rentals and we have three categories of those. I think we can all picture what hotels and motels look like. We are not talking about those today. Um, as far as other short-term rentals, we're dividing the peer-to-peer short-term rentals into these two categories. Accessory short-term rentals, which is where it's the primary residence of someone and they are renting space in their house. Um, our proposal is to allow that under limited circumstances, which I'll get into. The other category is vacation rentals, which is where nobody lives in the house and it's rented on a nightly basis, um, like a commercial use. We are proposing not to allow those, and so we are not talking about that anymore. Um, accessory <laughs> short-term rentals, we are differentiating, so this is the second key distinction with this proposal, is that we're um, proposing to differentiate the small from the big ones. The small ones we're calling type A because we need to be bureaucratic about it, I suppose. And those are the one and two bedroom um, rentals where um, one or two bedrooms are being rented out in a home and a type B, which is a three to five bedroom. What we're proposing is that the type B retain the current bed and breakfast regulations, so nothing will change, or virtually nothing will change for the three to five bedroom um, accessory short-term rentals. We won't call them bed and breakfast anymore. Some of them don't serve breakfast, so we're just trying to modernize our language. 
we will call them Job Site six. B Accessory Short-Term Rentals. Um, the rest of my presentation will focus on the Type A Short-Term Rental Proposal. Um, and I wanted to draw people's attention to the purple sheet. There are um, copies available in the back that summarizes what we're going through today. Um, and it's the first column that I'll be sharing with you. There are basically 10 provisions that we went through a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I'll just run through them real quickly. The first is that for, again, we're only talking about the one and two bedrooms here, that we are proposing to allow them as accessory to residential use. That means that the individual or family who operate the accessory short-term rental must occupy their unit as their primary residence. Next provision is we're proposing to allow it in these types of buildings. Note that we are not proposing to allow it in apartments or condominiums. Third, our proposed draft talked about um, the bedrooms needing to be legal bedrooms. After we published the proposed draft, staff was working with Bureau of Development Services on how to operationalize that standard and realized it would be very difficult for a property owner to know whether their bedrooms are legal. So we are proposing an amendment, which we presented to you on April 8th in a memo. In that um, proposal, we are basically saying, and the code set, uh, it stipulates, that BDS needs to verify that these bedrooms met the building code requirements for sleeping rooms at the time it was created or converted and have interconnected smoke detectors. That's a new amendment, and we have memos in the back with the exact language. Um, the fourth provision is that we're proposing that these um, a type A accessory short-term rentals be allowed through a permit rather than a, long, a lengthy land use review. This would be an administrative process, um, be renewed every two years, and a, a streamlined process for these operators. Um, the fifth provision is that a notice would be required um, to all recognized organizations and owners of property abutting or across the street from the residents. This is identical to our home occupation permit um, requirement, which is largely what we were um, um, modeling this permit process after. Number six, the number of guests allowed in the short-term rental is the same as what's currently allowed in a household. The seventh provision is that we're proposing that a short-term rental not be able to operate where there's already a home occupation. The thinking being that this has the same impacts as a home occupation, so either you can do a home occupation which allows up to eight customers a day or one employee, or you can do a short-term rental, either or. And the final three provisions is that no um, non-resident employees would be allowed, commercial meetings wouldn't be allowed, and that private social gatherings would not be limited. That is an amendment from what's currently in the bed and breakfast chapter, which um, gives a limit, I think, of 12 social gatherings a year. Um, um, so finally, in summary, I feel that we're bringing a proposal to the commission that really gives Portland residents the flexibility to use extra space in their, in, in their homes through an affordable and streamlined permit process, um, while at the same time ensuring that there is communication and notification to nearby neighbors. And with that, the, our recommendation is to approve items 12 through 14 in recap, as, as is shown on our slide here. Questions of Sandra at this point? Don? Uh, Sandra, I'm, I'm re looking at item four process. Under the type A accessory short-term rental permit, mm -hmm. it's, it's described as an over-the-counter permit, but there would be an inspection required. Once the inspection is complete, is there a certificate or something that demonstrates that they're in compliance, that they post at their house, or? Um, that they post at their house? Yeah. No, or so. A, or is it just a, a, an authorization? Or it's an authorization. Something? So right now, the home occupation permits, we do inspections also. So what would happen is an applicant comes in, submits the application form with the fee. We would communicate with them and say, we're ready to do the inspection, go out and do the inspection. And by issuing the permit, we're, um, okay. we're um, verifying so that. So the, the permits, the documentation. Yes. yes. Thanks. Yes, Howard. Um, Sandra, I've asked you this before, but will you clarify, this is number, uh, excuse me, um, uh, d defining who, who a, how, defining number of occupants. 
And again, it's one or more persons who are related by blood, marriage, legal adoption, guardianship, and then it kind of wanders off. Uh, people have no, different no, relationships. No, no, it doesn't wander off, plus not more than five additional persons. Well, okay, well, is that together. kind of where that goes? You don't want to say in a friend of the family or something. No, I'm, I don't want to be facetious, but it, it is, mm -hmm. it's so specific in certain areas that it just doesn't, other than say, mm -hmm. you can. So the idea behind this definition is that you could have one person living in a house and three unrelated college, college students, let's that's, just say, for simplicity purposes. So intended. that is the one or more persons related by blood, marriage, legal adoption, or guardianship, and then the three yeah up to non-related person, three additional people. Okay, just to clarify, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Chris? So I have um, several here. Um, do we know how many home occupation permits are in the city right now? I'm gonna invite my colleague, Mike Lee, filled up. Okay. Um, How good is Mike Lee? Do we know? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Is it 100, 1,000, or 10,000? Yeah, it's in the hundreds. It's, it, in the hundreds. it's not so over 1,000. It, it's no. smaller than the number of Airbnb listings that we know of, right? I and believe so. OK, yes. thank you. Um, the, the stipulation on, a, on not having non-resident employees, if a host had a cleaning service come in to clean the bedrooms, is that a non-resident employee, or is that just a service? And, and that's. Um, allowed. allowed. So what we've stipulated is um, it's not an employee of the business, like someone okay. who's there booking rooms, et cetera, right. um, okay. but that allowed hired service for normal maintenance of the site, yard, mm -hmm. cleaning is okay. what, so what every household in. Right. Just to follow up on that, so one of the concerns, well, maybe it doesn't get there. So one of the concerns we've heard is that, you know, permanent residence is not really defined. So, you know, what if somebody lived in a house six months a year and another six months a year, you know, essentially rented out for short-term rentals and had somebody, you know, manage that for them. I guess as long as that person was a contractor, not an employee, that provision doesn't really block that scenario, right? Correct. Okay. Yes, as long as it's a primary residence of right. the operator. Yeah. But we don't really define primary residence, so I'm having a little trouble with that. Um, and then uh, something you and I spoke about privately saying, I just want to get it in the record. Um, yeah, so we, we know there are something like 1,500 Airbnb listings right now in Portland. So if, you know, if this is adopted by council and, you know, uh, knowing the good citizens of Portland, all 1,500 are going to file their applications on the same day so they can get legal, right? Uh, obviously, we can't do 1,500 inspections instantly. Um, these folks who have been operating, you know, under the radar, you know, are suddenly on the radar because we have their permit application. Um, we wouldn't immediately start enforcement proceedings against all 1,500 until they got their inspections, right? They could continue to operate Airbnb because our, our philosophy on enforcement is we're seeking compliance. So if you have filed a permit, you're in the process of complying, and therefore we'd, mm -hmm. we'd let you go on operating until we finish the inspection, right? That is correct, okay. yes. So, I mean, so we, this, this, depending on what would come our way, We'd be looking at um, some high-level demand. Mm -hmm. We would look at prioritizing resources to get through the first crunch. Right. Um, it, it's not a level of demand that's going to be sustained mm -hmm. where we can staff right. up just for this. So yes, we would work with people, uh, make sure that we communicate that the application is pending, right. that they are complying with, with the new rule ordinance, and, uh, and get to them right. as fast as we could. So we would not be shutting down short-term rentals until you could get through the backlog? Absolutely not. It would be um, abeyance would be the term right. we would use, yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I'm going to go here, and then we'll come back around. Did you, oh, we'll, we'll just go there, and then we'll come back around over here. Go ahead, Catherine. So just to clarify, Sandra, it says a one- to two-week process. Is that including the time for the inspections? So if it, I show up, I fill up the form for my permit, somebody's going to inspect, and I can rent out my my room within one to two weeks. That's the goal. Granted, that 15, 000, or 1,500 rush might delay that a little bit, but otherwise. Yes, the application form would be mailed in to us. We would process it, get a case set up, and make contact to schedule the inspection, complete the inspection, issue the approval, and um, generally looking at one to two weeks to do all of that. And I assume they could email you the permit instead of mail it. 
we would probably we're not set up to take electronic submissions at this time based on our computer database. We're moving that direction with our new information technology advancement project. Very exciting. Uh, we're not there just yet. That is uh, exciting. There will be some additional application requirements that, that we will be asking for, such as a copy of the driver's license of the primary resident, showing that somebody does occupy the home. Um, at least in the eyes of the state, they've told somebody that they are occupying it. And that's about as far as we can go with that issue of occupancy. Um, and then one kind of last question, I also talked with you a bit, Sandra, about this, is my concern about, and so I'd love to have you clarify this a little bit for the mm -hmm. record, about inspections and, and how to limit the inspections to just the scope that's written in this section of the zoning code. And so mm -hmm. it's just the bedroom and just the smoke detectors. And, um, and I think you would tell me it's kind of a different inspection group versus building inspection group. So maybe if you could kind of clarify that, that'd be helpful. Well, Mike leads that inspection group, so maybe. Hmm. Mike. It, Mike, that'd be great. Yes, happy, happy to do that, yes. Um, so the Bureau currently provides fee paid inspections. This is modeled after that exact same process. Uh, one thing, uh, type of inspection is very similar is an attic inspection. In, in the absence of historical permits, we find certain structures. We don't have a legal record whether or not it was built as a one-story home, one and a half story, two stories. We don't have um, records if the attic space has been illegally converted or was originally built to be habitable space. So we perform this type of inspection to look at that issue. Um, we would be doing the same thing for short-term rentals where we would be limited to is the space legal? What is it? Is it being used for how it was originally intended? And we have a number of ways that the inspectors who are trained with um, construction methodology, historical construction techniques, materials, they would look for those items. Um, it's more of an art than a science, I will tell you, in absence of historical good documents. Um, but they know what they're looking for. And we've been very successful doing it with the fee paid inspections that we're currently operating. We do have an obligation, though, to make people aware that if we are brought into a space that has been illegally converted and it has not been approved for habitable space, um, that we will have to follow up on that. We cannot, you know, the trained inspectors operating in a state building program, we, we cannot turn away and walk away from that. But that's not the scope. We're not looking for that. We're going to address it if we are brought into that situation. But we are going to go in, look to see that the space is legal, the bedrooms that are proposed to be rented out, and then verify that uh, they have the interconnected smoke detectors. And that is the extent of our inspection. Unless, though, unless we see sparking wires hanging from the ceiling, <laughs> other types of imminent safety hazards, we, we, we do have to address those. So we would put information out there to try to let people know what we're looking for so hopefully they could get their home in order uh, before they invite us in. So one quick follow-up, and then I'll leave it at that. So if on the way up the stairs to that bedroom in the attic, the riser's a little bit off, does that now mean they don't have a legal bedroom? No, it does not, because we have thresholds for the different stairways that were allowed through the various code iterations over time. And so we know that the original stairway isn't going to be close to current standards. Um, we do, we will be looking, though, if we can see that the tread has been replaced at the top, where they've taken it and they've turned it, or they've, they've put in uh, triangular treads, where they've redone it. But if we're looking for original materials and it hasn't been changed, then it, that's going to pass. That's acceptable to us. So it does go past the scope of the bedroom itself is where I'm getting at. So now we're talking about the path to the bedroom is also being inspected as a part of the process. If the bedroom is proposed to be in a basement or attic, yes, we, that is verifying whether or not that basement or attic was originally proposed as habitable space as opposed to storage. And that is the, the, those two areas have that distinction exclusive to those two areas. I would also say a garage. If we're being brought into a garage bedroom, we're going to ask that question, was this originally built as a sleeping room or as a storage area? Yeah. OK, thanks, Mike. Michelle? Okay, so um, at the briefing, I asked about the definition that said occupants and related by marriage and how mm -hmm. the city dealt with same-sex couples in mm -hmm. that context. Were you able to find out? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't get back to you about that. So we did talk to the city attorney about that. And um, what she suggested, if we wanted to amend the language, 
wouldn't be necessarily about same-sex couples, it would be about domestic partnership because domestic partners are um, recognized by the state of Oregon mm -hmm. and would um, recognize of course both same-sex domestic partner and opposite-sex domestic partners. So if <clears throat> we wanted to amend the definition of household, um, we could do that by saying by blood, marriage, legal adoption, guardianship, or domestic partnership. Mm -hmm. okay. And then that would be, um, there would be something to tie it to the state. Okay, um, next question. And am I correct that you have your home occupation fee, but there's a separate fee for the inspection? For the home occupation so you, process or, or so the short-term rental? So process. for the short-term rental, you pay your 150, 180, 180 for mm -hmm. the permit. Does that include the cost of somebody from BDS coming out and inspecting? Inspection yes. And we think that's cost recovery, that's enough to cover it? There's not a that is cost. There? That's cost recovery okay. for that process. And then the other one's four grand. Okay, and then the other thing, just to clarify for the record, if you have a basic home occupation that doesn't have external impacts, you don't have customers coming to the site, you could still have that type of home occupation and do a rental. Right. There are two types of home occupation. A type A home occupation is one where you don't have any customers or um, employees coming to the site, and a type B is where you have either one employee or up to eight customers a day. And so the, what the code says is no type B home occupations with the type A accessory short-term rental permit. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly clear. <laughs> Karen? Gary. Oh, Gary. Oh, Gary. Um, Sandra, I understand that vacation rentals are not included um, in, in the regulation here, but um, my question is really the rationale for that. Yeah. Um, because it seems to me that the risks to the neighborhood and the risks to the renters are comparable. It's just the length, um, the length of time that distinguishes the two. So I'm just curious about how it yeah. fell out that way. So I think the distinction is more than just the length of time. The distinction is that um, that one is a primary residence of a Portlander who's living here and one is not, and nobody lives here, lives in that. So that's what, how we're um, distinguishing vacation rentals from accessory short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. The rationale behind that was um, the purpose of residential zones is to provide land for housing. We have a very um, um, low vacancy rate in Portland, so we want to make sure we have housing <coughs> enough for Portlanders who are living and working here and that we have those in the right place. You'll be getting into this discussion during the comprehensive plan update. Um, project. So we felt that by allowing, if we allowed for vacation rentals, it would be taking that unit off the market um, for for a permanent resident. Okay, uh, let me focus in a little bit more tightly. Um, for a lot of people who are retired, they spend months out of the months of the year out of the city and well beyond the 30 days. So if somebody rents out their house for three months while they go down to Arizona or whatever, in effect, that's a vacation rental, isn't it? No, so it's that would not. we would still consider that a, that's still the primary residence of the Portlander who happens to be somewhere else for a significant chunk of time. So they would be eligible to apply for the type A um, accessory short-term rental permit. Even though it's more than 30 days? Yes, if it's more than 30 days, they don't even need to get a permit. I guess I should take a step back. They don't even need to get a short-term rental permit because that's just considered regular long-term leasing of your dwelling unit. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay, so, so, that, so that falls more into the classification of I'm gonna rent my okay. house out for four years. Yeah. Exactly, Okay. exactly. Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Karen? Yeah, just a quick question, just a clarification on the required notice. Um, operator sends a notice including their contact information to all recognized organizations. So as a clarification, would that include neighborhood watches and neighborhood associations? It does not include neighborhood watches. It includes neighborhood association, businesses associations, um, neighborhood coalition offices. I believe it's, that's it. And that's um, all run through the Office of Neighborhood Involvement. And it's okay. consistent with the language we use for all of our notices for land use reviews, whether you're doing a zoning map amendment or, or this. So the only thing I would, and 
I'm glad to hear about the neighborhood associations, but mm -hmm. um, just a comment about neighborhood watches is that um, sometimes their job is to watch. And so when they see uh, interesting things going on in the neighborhood, people coming and going, mm -hmm. um, it can create stress in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. I just thought I'd mention that. Thank you. That's all. Other comments, questions before we get to testimony? Get to the testimony. We'll start testimony. Um, first, if anybody wants to testify on short-term rentals, um, recap six, please fill out a form in the back, provide it to Julie. You will have two minutes. I will call up three individuals at a time and uh, we'll um, just allow you three minutes. When you see the red light, please give us your very last Please. thought quickly, and we'll move on to the rest because we'd like to get through everybody tonight to hear their testimony. Um, first will be Terry Parker, Joan Sterick, Bill Perry. Will those individuals come up? Joan? Once the educator has that, it's for life. <laughs> Again, you have two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Terry. My name's Terry Parker. I'm a fourth generation Portlander. I live in and own the single family home my parents bought originally in 1954. The primary purpose of our zoned single family home neighborhoods has always been to provide a safe haven refuge where people can live, have yards, potentially raise a family, and be free from the direct contact with commercial activities. The ploy to allow some of these homes to be commercially operated as a motel, be it only one or two bedrooms, is in direct conflict with the residential sanctuary of these neighborhoods. Not only does the concept set up an impending neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor clashes, but unscrupulous enterprising individuals could buy up numerous properties and even rent out the rooms uh, by the hour. Homeowners could end up with a motel row across the street or even in their backyards. When a police officer is invited to speak in a neighborhood association meeting, uh, the likely first thing that the officer says in terms of safety is to know who's coming and going in your neighborhood. The short-term rental scheme in RICAP 6 violates the rights of homeowners who purchase their properties in residential zoned only neighborhoods. The entire short-term rental proposal as a right needs to be removed from RICAP 6. It is not a minor code amendment and needs a broader community discussion. After a fully transparent vetting process, if the short-term rental plan is implemented, a number of safeguards need to be met. They include uh, approval by the majority of property owners and a requirement for an annual review or application that allows neighborhoods to reevaluate the activity, a requirement for an annual fee that includes inspections for health and safety, and finally, uh, short-term rentals need to be disallowed in our zone single-family neighborhoods such as R5, R2.5, R7.5, thereby protecting the rights of homeowners that purchase their properties in these residential-only zone neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Joan? Thank you. I'm Joan Sterrett, a resident of Portland, and uh, I'm here to speak about the amendments recommended by the um, Department of um, Planning and Sustainability. Uh, in my opinion, all 10 of these amendments um, violate the zoning codes, codes applied to residential throughout the city. R5, 10, 20, et cetera, were applied many years ago to restrict overbuilding, retain conformity with the environment of the area, and maintain a reasonable population count for residential neighborhoods. Items one through 10, these amendments, variable conditions for short-term rentals, B and B, all of which I feel will be impossible to regulate. In reality, they open a Pandora's box for other uses in residential neighborhoods. As an example, mother-in-law apartments, accessory units require the property owner to maintain that unit in good condition and provide on-site parking. In my neighborhood, there are visible violations of these requirements and obviously they are not being monitored and neighbors are most reluctant to ask property owners to conform or report the violations to the authorities. The internet companies Airbus and HomeAway 
have monetary reasons to support these amendments. The same can be said for homeowners who want to commercialize their own residence for additional income. Should they have priority over residents who have selected to live in certain neighborhoods because of the quiet and well-maintained properties, the ambience therein, and they pay high property taxes for these to be sustained, allowing nightly rentals, which bring transients into populations. Please give us your last uh, thoughts. Resident populations will certainly disrupt all of this and have negative aspects. Foremost is safety and security of person and property, increased vehicular traffic, and on street and and on street parking deterioration of property values should be assessed by you. John, thank you. Thank you. Bill. Uh, for the record, Bill Perry the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association uh, Chair and members of the commission, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, first, I, I wasn't here for the tax portion of this, but really from a legal standpoint, statutorily, there's no difference between uh, Expedia and, and Airbnb. They should already be paying taxes uh, because they're collecting money from the consumers. Doesn't The law does not stipulate a difference between one room and a house or a 200-room a hotel. Um, so that should already be collected. The city has a suit against the OTCs. They should have, in my opinion, included uh, the other uh, Trevor and Marys in the, in the case. From my standpoint, the inspection process, without knowing it completely, uh, I just want to make sure that it covers everything, fire exit, fire regress, all those things need to be considered because the safety of the consumer is, I think, of the utmost importance for all of us. Um, the other is, you know, it, even though it's a primary residence, is somebody going to be there? Does the consumer have somebody to contact if they don't know the neighborhood? Does the neighbors have somebody to contact directly if there's a problem? Having somebody on site, I think, is more important, in my opinion, than necessarily being an owner-occupied, because there has to be a way to address problems, both from the consumers and, and the neighboring situations. And I would also say, as you move forward, have the mortgage lender and the insurance companies been notified that a commercial practice is taking place, because they're going to have their own things that are considered they want to be taken care of uh, before a commercial enterprise. And two, if they rent a room, the homeowner's policies a lot of times is not uh, not covering the renter, it's only uh, covering a guest. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done, plus I don't know why they wouldn't have annual inspections because everybody else has annual inspections. So it just seems whatever the cost of the inspections with the sound likes is covered, it might as be annual uh, because a lot can happen in two years. Restaurants, we have to be inspected twice a year. So. Uh, we pay for those inspections, as Mr. Oxman well knows. Uh, but uh, so I just, you know, think that these need to be considered more like businesses. If they're not going to go through the conditional use permit zones, you need to find other ways to make sure the consumer is being uh, protected. Did I go too long? Sorry. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much. John Hannum, Stephen Unger, Dustin Carsey. <coughs> John? Uh, thank you for having me. My name is John Hannum, for the record. Mr. Chair, members of the commission and staff, I want to thank you for your hard work. Clearly, this is a contentious issue, as you can see by the number of people here. I will definitely try to be under two minutes and would invite any questions you might have. The first point that I would like to make that others have is this is not a minor policy change. If I got the numbers right, there's about 1,000 short-term rentals. There's about 265,000 homes in the city of Portland, according to Google which you can't always trust, but in a democracy, typically, public policy is crafted to favor the needs of the many over the few. This seems to be the other way around. So I would really ask the commission and the planning folks thereof to take a step back, not hurry up, fully validate what's going on here, really try to understand the need for this, and put it out to the vote. Why be in a hurry? Second point I'd like to make is on the notion of livability and zoning. It's already been mentioned, but I'd like to reinforce a couple things. We already have zoning that allows neighborhoods and commercial zones to coexist. Short-term rentals, as proposed, breaks that. 
The Supreme Court, in one ruling, and I don't remember the, uh, the ruling specifically, said that regarding livability in neighborhoods, yards should be wide, people few, and vehicles restricted. This short-term rental, as proposed, seems to be in direct opposition to that notion. As people have mentioned, the idea of a neighborhood is an opportunity to raise a family, know your neighbors, and know that your neighborhood watch and the city of Portland police have your back. The short-term rentals to propose is not congruent with that. Look, we know there's a big PR com campaign, excuse me, by Airbnb to promote this. They spend a lot of money on this. They've hired one of the most prestigious and experienced public relations, <clears throat> excuse me, public relations firm in town. Please don't let the amount of money uh, accelerate the process at the expense of all the people that are, could be impacted by this. Part of the marketing campaign is the notion of a shared city. Give, give us your last Thank thoughts you. there. Uh, this is not a shared city. This is shared nothing for Airbnb. They're leveraging, wanting to leverage, and I applaud them for coming up with a marketing way to make money. That's the American way. But please not at the expense of the people that live here. In summary, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I want to ask you to open up the debate on this. Portland advertises itself as the, your thank sustainable you. uh, city. You. Please let's not become a brand and a subsidiary of Airbnb. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. I ran over. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Dustin Carsey. I'm co-owner of the Lion and the Rose Bed and Breakfast at 1810 Northeast 15th. And uh, we've been coming to meetings like this for at least six months. We've said most everything we're going to say tonight to you before. We've sent letters and documents to you throughout this period of time. So nothing I say tonight should be surprising. Go to Google when you get home. Look at how many articles there are about Airbnb on Google right now. Today, in the state of New York, a long protracted process resisted by Airbnb, where the state attorney general is pressing, release the names, release the names. I beg you, require the names be released from all these organizations because otherwise enforcement and accountability is literally impossible. Um, what we should be thinking about is a really great business environment, and that means transparency, accountability, and enforcement. And this. This uh, recap six, I, I'm grateful for the, the for the bits of progress that this is trying to make, but this is actually think about it, putting a ten billion dollar corporation in the same category as home piano teachers and hairdressers. It's literally doing exactly that, and when you think of the legal teams, the PR teams, and and the people we've met with from Airbnb. Uh, it's, it's, um, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel clean. It doesn't feel straight. And, it, and they still, to this moment, are defending the fact that none of their uh, renters or their host's name should be released, that that's a matter of privacy. And, and yet all these other people, like the piano teachers and the hairdressers, are, are required to get a permit, required to reveal their name, their location. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it's like uh, Recap 6 to me is like putting a football team in a, in a Volkswagen bug. It's just too big a subject, as this gentleman uh, addressed, to, to cram it into this small. And in every meeting I've been to, this team for Recap 6 says thank you. this is a small ordinance that we're trying to consider here, not a big one. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Stephen? Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Unger. And, uh, I co-own and operate the Line in the Rose Bed and Breakfast in Portland with my partner. I'm here uh, to talk with you about Airbnb, short-term rentals in Portland, and make some specific recommendations on how to modify Recap 6. In a few short years, Airbnb has gone from promoting couch surfing to private room rentals to entire place rentals. And it is critical to recognize the difference between Airbnb private room rentals, the focus of Recap 6, and entire place rentals, which are really unsupervised vacation rentals. I personally support host present private room rentals because a host is resident to supervise the property and the guests during the guest stay. Also, these rentals usually are less expensive than commercial hotels, good for tourists, help people stay in their homes, and do not deplete the stock of month to month rentals. But on the other hand, I believe that host absent Airbnb entire place rentals <coughs> need to be held to a much higher standard. They are not supervised, typically rent for $100 to $1,000 a night, 
deplete the stock of monthly rentals, drive up rental prices, don't help people stay in their homes, and are the source of most Airbnb horror stories. The difference is really easy to understand. How likely is a guest to hold a wild party or orgy, engage in prostitution, or run an erotic massage service, <laughs> all of which are recent Airbnb horror stories, if they know that a host is likely to return home <laughs> before midnight. There are four things you can do to make, Airbnb, uh, to make Recap 6 better. One, give a definition to what percent of time it's a primary resident. Two, and this is the critical one, specify that a host is resident during the guest stay. That's the distinction between private room rentals and entire place rentals. Give us your last one here. Require a license number be issued and be present in all online and print advertising. This would make enforcement much easier. And I have two other recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Is this your written testimony you just read? Yeah. OK. Thanks. As much Thank as you. I could do it. Because I thought it was three minutes. Yeah. This okay. is um, the next three are Tamara DeRitter, Michael Roth, William Gregg. Tamara, you want to start? Sure. Um, my name's Tamara DeRitter, 1707 Northeast 52nd. I'm representing the Rose City Park Neighborhood Association tonight. Uh, I, we have submitted a, a letter of opposition, I believe, that contains about 19 uh, findings of fact of how the current proposal for short-term amendments, uh, short-term rentals, do not meet the comprehensive plan and also do not meet the municipal code. I'm not going to go and cite through each and every one of those because you have that in your docket, but I want to touch on the three primary issues. One is that short-term rental amendment should be pulled from RICAP 6. It is a major amendment. And um, trying to interpret this in, uh, amendment under the definition of a refinement or a minor amendment um, to the uh, existing B&B policy is like trying to convince us that making Powell Boulevard into the Mount Hood Freeway is a minor amendment. We have maybe 100 or so approved bed and breakfast here in Portland. This amendment would pr propose to expand that approved bed and breakfast, I mean, that number to over 1,000% overnight and by making it by right um, a commercial use this, this has a commercial use in residential zones. Um, please separate this out. It is a much more, it's a much broader issue. The other uh, two points, one is if short-term rentals are allowed in single-family dwelling zones, it should only be permitted in bedrooms of an owner-occupied primary residence. What you have right now is the term operator. That means someone else could own that property and then hire a number of folks to stay in these different homes and not necessarily be there when they're being rented out. Right now, the second item is owners need to be, are to be staying at the residence when the boarders are present. Right now, that's not the case. People can take <coughs> off, go to the beach, and that means the entire home Make is being rented point. out. Make your last point, your last point real quick. My last point is, there's documentation uh, recently, I, I added this to the testimony, um, that is uh, that short-term rentals are driving up the cost of long-term rental uh, houses uh, because it's allowing absentee investors to um, become owners. And it's, a, it's not just here, but it's nationwide. So it's, it's an uh, epidemic type problem and it's causing the cost of uh, long-term rentals to go much higher. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michael Roth. I'm chair of Road City Park Neighborhood with Tamara there. Um, I, uh, this issue was first brought to me by a local neighborhood resident, resident Susan Hammond. 
And uh, I thought, oh, that sounds like a great idea. You know, people can rent out a room or two uh, in their retirement and it helps them get pay their taxes, pay their costs. And so I started doing some internet research. And I looked at where this has gone in in other cities. And there's just a long, long, never-ending list of complaints about many of the uh, extremes that have been happening in this situation. So uh, I talked with Tamara. We talked about this at our Land Use and Transportation Committee. And uh, looking at the plan, it seems like this is a major change and should be pulled out of RICAP 6, that this has enough quality of life and equity issues alone that it should be pulled out and considered separately. Do the math. $180 for 1,500 units is what I was hearing earlier this evening. That's $270,000. That's going to go just like that in trying to do inspections. Or if there's one lawsuit that is brought on an issue of equity against the city, that it should be more like $1,000 for a permit fee to do this. And there should be annual renewals. It could be a step-down amount. I want you to know that Rose City Park Neighborhood Association really feels opposed to this. Our, vote, our board voted against uh, accepting RICAP 6 and asked that it be pulled out. We've entered a letter, uh, the Central Northeast Neighbors, which is a coalition of eight neighborhoods, also sent in a letter. This affects our quality of life, and this isn't the right process for it. I'm not against this, but we need to set it up right. Portland's known for quality of life and being on the leading edge of doing the right things in a modern Thank society. You. Let's do it right. Thank you. Uh, William Gregg, 1235 Southeast Salmon, Buckman resident. <clears throat> I question, um, just like Tamara, that Recap 6 should uh, consider taking this totally out. It's To me, it's just as important of issue as the apartment parking issue was last year and that should be vetted thoroughly by itself. As far as the issues, are these inspections annual or one time only? I feel they need to be annual, both smoke and CO2 alarms for gas supplied houses need to be required and tested annually. In Austin, Texas, they require third party inspections paid for by the business, and I agree with that approach. Fines need to be there for non-compliance, and we need the ability for the city to revoke a permit once issued. Hosts need to be present at all times. If they're gone for two weeks um, for vacation, no short-term renting should be done, should be allowed during that time. Since Airbnb hides addresses, we need the ability to audit compliance, so permit numbers should be put in all, required to be put in all ads. Even better, sites like Airbnb should provide contact information to the city for all of its listings. <clears throat> Next on insurance. This absolutely needs to be part of an element of the package. After talking with the State of Oregon Insurance Commissioner, six different insurance agents and two insurance companies, they unequivocally say that not a single home that is carrying homeowners insurance is covered for liability or property damage for those renting out commercially by the night. This is a huge issue. Finally, the city has decided to, so far, to not allow uh, non-hosted houses, except for ADUs, tied to a family home. This leaves hundreds of places still to operate in violation of all laws, continuing their renting on Airbnb and others, and almost no chance to stop them. I feel that these sh that these should go through, for instance, a type two variance, and that some of these should be allowed, although just like a, a type B. Uh, air, uh, Thank you. Thanks. Questions? Chris? So for the folks from Rose City, um, has your neighbor association ever filed a complaint against uh, somebody operating one of these short-term rentals illegally? No. Uh, neighbors have brought complaints yeah. to us. And that these were people who were standing outside to block down the street, smoking, making noise. Uh, they reported traffic problems. Um, so that's already occurred. We haven't processed anything. 
it's, there's one noise complaint officer in the city. The amount of money being charged for these permits is not going to pay anywhere near the, the compliance people that we should have in place. Right. So we don't you know, proactively enforce on this issue today and don't propose to in the future. But what I'm asking is, you know, we do complaint-based enforcement. So if somebody said, you know, my neighbor is operating one of these illegally, we'd send somebody out to check it out. So I'm asking, if you're experiencing problems, have you, have you ever filed such a complaint with BDS so they could go out and inspect for it? Chris, I have. And uh, t basically trying to work through Airbnb itself and telling a neighbor, you know, that they're not in comp compliance. This was like a year ago or something like this. Airbnb's <clears throat> response was to cancel my account. So that's how they handled it. I think knowing uh, who to call at the city. I mean, most people call the police if there's an issue. They don't know, think of calling the Zoning and Planning Bureau. So part of that is pe neighbors, it comes by the grapevine through coat, um, block watches that there's a problem and then you know they may or may not know to contact the zoning bureau for enforcement thank you, thank you. other questions nope thank you, thank you. jane slunk slanker renate powell and richard mills renata that's renata powell Renata. You didn't say her correctly. Renata. Hi, Renata. Hello. How are you? Full disclosure, I know Ms. Powell. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Howard knows well, She's that's a dear, dear friend. Dear friend. It's good to know Howard. <laughs> are we ready? Um, we're missing one. Richard Mills. Okay. Jane. Is there a Jane in the crowd? Going once, twice. John Cohen. <clears throat> Go ahead. All right. My name is Renata Powell. I live in Selwood. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the discussion regarding short term rentals. Discussion that is exactly what is needed for the discussion. The draft of RECAP Package 6 is a good starting point, but needs more thought for successful execution. There was a letter submitted um, for the record by the Laurelhurst neighborhood with six items, which request more details than the RECAP draft pr provides. I just want to underline two of those items. Personally, I've used short-term rentals in five different cities and I've had nothing but a good experience, so I'm not against short-term rentals at all. But I feel strongly the owner should reside on the premises because it is, uh, even though there are other advantages to have a short, to use a short-term rental system such as lower prices, but the contact with the person who owns the unit is much more valuable than, uh, than the difference in price. Um, now, the recap, this list states that the owner has to be on the premises, which I think is a very important point. <clears throat> However, yesterday on, on Sunset Magazine, they have an article on Airbnb, and it says the owner does not necessarily have to be on premises. So please keep that in mind. The other item uh, that I want to talk about is parking. If you rent a cabin in the woods, obviously that's not a problem. But in a densely populated urban neighborhood where most of the units are, it is a problem, especially in our neighborhood. Uh, we rented an apartment in San Francisco where the owner allowed us to use his garage when he parked his car on the street. So that was one way they dealt with it. But it's something that needs to be discussed. So briefly, I feel that further discussion is needed to make sure that these accommodations are integrated into the neighborhood, residential neighborhood, Thank without you. harming the quality of life. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Cohen, and I'm at 4106 Southwest 44th Avenue. Um, and while I'm a member of the Bridal Mile Neighborhood Association, I'm not here appearing here in official capacity. Um, 
and I don't profess to know all the ins and outs of RECAP 6 uh, or the full details of the Airbnb proposal, but I do know that this issue deserves the full attention of the communities potentially impacted by the proposed changes. Uh, and these issues are far more than technical or clarifying changes to existing zoning codes. Residential zoning draws homeowners to our neighborhoods with the expectation that single family residences will house single families for the long term and that short term hotel like rentals are not present. The proposed changes could bring transient living into the expected stable communities of an R5 or an R10 residential zone. Revising the zoning definition of a major residential zoning designation does not qualify as a technical matter, clarification, or refinement of existing policy. Changes to the zoning designation is a major policy change that impacts neighborhoods throughout Portland and deserves the full legislative process. This is not a matter to be hidden in so-called technical changes. Operating a better bed and breakfast or allowing a month-to-month -month rental of an ADU is different than allowing weekly rentals of a house or a room in a house. Uh, owners in residential neighborhoods do not expect to live next to a rooming house, and owners do not expect their neighbors to build ADUs for the purpose of creating short-term rentals. It's possible that an influx of these short-term uses can change the complexion of a neighborhood unless changes go through the appropriate legislative process to ensure protection of all who reside in the neighborhood and not simply a process to benefit those like Airbnb who stand to gain financially. So I urge you not to use the short shortcut mechanism to take away valuable property rights of Portland homeowners and don't use the short-sighted process to implement a change that will certainly foster expensive litigation. Use the appropriate process for making major changes to the zoning code. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Richard Mills, and I live at 2436 Northeast 18th Avenue. As I see it, these proposed changes would maximize revenue for Airbnb in Portland and increase the city's tax revenues, but they would also negatively impact Portland residents. The proposed regulations do not represent any form of regulation of short-term rentals. Instead, they purposefully encourage such rentals, effectively contributing to the increasing commercialization of neighborhoods that were previously purely residential in character. The proposed regulations allow all single-family residences to operate bed and breakfast facilities. The proposed regulations, furthermore, explicitly shield the City of Portland from providing any regulatory relief from neighbors who are negatively affected by the operation of such short-term rentals. The onus is entirely on the neighbors to obtain relief from the operators of these rentals. It also appears that there is no provision to allow prospective purchasers of single-family residences to determine in advance whether adjacent houses operate short-term rentals. The occupants of short-term rentals comprise a transient population in addition to the long-term occupants of these private residences. The presence of such a transient population will necessarily generate greater, greater levels of activities and traffic above and beyond that which is generated by the long-term residents. How can the Planning and Sustainability Commission not understand that the widespread offering of such rentals has the potential to impact severely the quality of life in residential areas? Rather than encouraging short-term rentals throughout Portland, the city instead should establish regulations that restrict and limit them. As currently drafted, the proposed regulations focus entirely on allowing property owners to commercialize their private residences and increase city revenues while simultaneously ignoring the negative impacts that will inevitably ensue. In summary, I believe that the proposed regulations concerning short-term rentals are extremely ill-considered and should not be approved in their current form. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Rich and Nana, Nola Gray, Fred Gordon. Hello, I'm Rich and Nana. Um, I am working with Airbnb hosts um, to create a platform for hosts to communicate with each other directly called Posh, the Portland Organization of Short-Term Hosts. We just recently bought the domain name, pdxposh.org. We don't have any content yet, but we'll be up and running soon. I've observed that the interests of hosts and the interests of Airbnb are sometimes very different. Currently, hosts take all the risk, and the fees are passed on to both hosts and guests. And Airbnb without benefits, without paying for the cost or the risk. 
I would propose that Recap 6 amend to share the fees with Airbnb. For Slitch, Airbnb shares the fees with hosts and guests. Seems reasonable. Um, which is one of many conversations that should be had among hosts. So I'm working on gathering some information for people to get a conversation started. So if any of the hosts here have any interest in being part of that conversation, please come find me. That's all. Thank you. Go ahead. Is this on? Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Nola Gray. I live at 4724 Selfies Taylor in Portland. And I specialize in um, short, medium, and long-term rentals. Um, I actually supply to the city a different form of housing than I, I don't actually know anyone else who does. I actually supply housing for disabled people, um, especially people who have environmental illness, severe allergies, multiple chemical sensitivities. Um, I wish there was more people who actually had this um, available for people to use. Um, I do use Airbnb. I've used it for three years. And um, I have to say is that it's been an amazing experience, and it actually helps keep me as a disabled person in my home. Um, an example of some people who would stay would be residents who live in Portland and become sick living in their homes, and they need to stay with me for a while while they look for other housing. Other people who have moved to Portland, and it takes them a while to find housing because of their medical disability, and they stay with me while they, in this very, very tight market, try to find a place to stay. Also, um, some of these transients are people like grandma, who is visiting the couple who just had the new baby, and they have a cat, and she can't sleep on the couch anyway. And so she stays with me for a while while she um, helps take care of the newest Portland resident. Um, there are some hotels and motels which are trying to fill this need. Um, but even in surveys, 17% of pet owners say that they sneak pets into non-pet allowing hotels. Um, also, in a hotel, trying to keep things scent free is very, very, very challenging, as well as um, knowing what building supplies um, are in the buildings itself. Um, I would like to propose an amendment for exceptions um, for disabled housing. It's such a tight market, and this particular um, part of the population of residents and non-residents is particularly fragile. Um, I also would like to offer myself as a resource to answer any questions that you might have about um, this subsection of what I think is actually a, a very fair proposal that the city is putting forth. Thank you. Hi, Fred Gordon. I'm a Portland resident, and I have done short-term rentals. Uh, I have a neighbor who rents his rooms by the year and month. Uh, and looking at our impact, I notify my neighbors. I pay taxes. They pay the, sh the, the transient tax, uh, which he does not. I cannot discern, as hard as I try, the difference in impact between his long-term and my short-term rental. Uh, it happens that he has a car, the renter. Two-thirds of the time, our renters don't have cars. That's a coincidence. I think my point is it's really hard to tell the difference in impact. And I think one of the ways that I think the staff has really carefully delineated this proposal is that it really doesn't provide different impacts than other uses that are allowed in residential space. I think any zoning law is some, a balancing act between the interests of the individual and their neighbors and their community. And I think they cut it pretty well. I agree with the proposal that a permanent, you know, a rental of a space that the owner doesn't occupy is a different issue that should not be addressed at the same time. It is more complicated. I agree with the fact there should be inspections. I think the neighbors should be notified. My neighbors know what we do. Uh, they don't have any trouble with it. And I want to emphasize that these people are coming to live with us. If anybody cares about the character and reliability of the people, it's us because they're in our house. Uh, the service we work with, which doesn't own the home, we do. This is not an Airbnb business. This is our business. Uh, they give us information online where we can screen people and we can decide if the people are acceptable. And you can be sure that since we do live there, we're careful about that. And we're present. And that's, that's part of running the business. Well, if you do, don't do that, uh, you're asking for your own problems. So I think there is accountability. I think it's similar to services that people can now do in the zone. It is a new thing. It's already there, uh, but I think it's good to bring it into the legal system as well as the tax system. And I think this proposal cuts pretty close to the mark. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? 
Um, hold the applause. Um, I have a question um, for you. No, is so your amendment? I didn't understand it. I guess clearly. Well, I mean, I'd probably fit under the category of one or you know one or two for under thirty days, and sometimes I have an over thirty days type people staying with me as well, which is is not part of this amendment. But like, I have a property which is what I understand the only um, non chemical, non allergy wheelchair accessible space in the east side that I know of. Um, so, you know, for me, there's other sort of business plans I could do, but I would like to have this accessible to people who are disabled. And so to understand that for, you know, for example, my house, which is very, very unique in this way, when I travel to visit my family in Ireland, that I would like to be able to offer this to people who seriously need it. Um, but, but you're not making it necessary for all the MDs to be... Accessible. No, I, I don't think that's that's not possible or feasible. No, no, no. So I think he's yeah. doing, we're trying to understand your, your amendment about um, that there could be exceptions to properties that are oh, accessible. Okay. You know, I for see. example, a less than thirty day yeah. GB possible if it's a very be. unique type place that you know for me I would like to be able to offer. So, and I've actually spoken to the city about this for the last three years, and there's been actually some positive feedback because they kind of were understanding what I was trying to do. Okay. So. Other questions? I have one more question for both of you, um, since you're part of the Airbnb. Um, do you own your own homes? I do. I do. All right, thanks. Did you have another question? No, I didn't even be part of Airbnb. Huh? Well, they're. Are you, are you Host. Hosts. Okay. Teresa Hannum, Amanda White, and Kevin Goomer. Go ahead. I start? I'm Teresa. Teresa. Yep. Um, my name is Teresa Hannum. I live at 4015 Northeast Davis Street in Laurelhurst. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I am here to implore you not to change the zoning code in single family neighborhoods to allow for short term rentals. I do not want you to let a corporation that's on a verge of an IPO brand our city like we were one of their products and change policy that will affect thousands and thousands of Portlanders. People choose to live in neighborhoods to connect with their neighbors and to establish and nurture a sense of community. Neighbors become closer and closer over months and years by borrowing cups of sugar, talking about their gardens, watching out for each other's property. They share laughter, stories, and sometimes tears. This is what neighbors do. Permanent tenants of rental properties become part of our neighborhoods and also enrich our community. We have a chance to get to know them. Short-term renters do nothing to contribute to or enrich our neighborhood. The only thing short-term renters do is line the pockets of individuals who have done the math and have figured out that they can make more money renting short-term than if they have a permanent tenant. All you have to do is do the math. If somebody rents 200 nights a year at $100 a night, that's $20,000. If they rent their basement apartment or a room in their house, even let's say generous 1,000, that's $12,000. The difference is $8,000. This is about money, from my opinion. In short, by changing the zoning laws, in single-family neighborhoods, you will be creating commercial zones. Yes, that, that is what it's like to live next door to a short-term rental property, as we did. It's like living next to a little motel. People coming and going at all time and all hours, suitcases rolling up and down, loud noise. Nobody in the neighborhood has any idea who they are. They're strangers that were found on a business website. As far as I can see, the only thing this minor policy change will do is disallow people like myself to lodge a formal complaint of the city, which I had to do. It was not fun and it was a lot of work, but I did it for my mom who has lived in her house for 55 years. I wanted her to feel safe and secure again. She is my number one priority. I want her to be able to live out her days in her house. Thank you peacefully and with a sense of security from knowing her neighbors. I think everyone should think too. Thank you. One day you might be an elderly person living next to one of these and you should think about that. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Amanda White and I live at 6916 Northeast Garfield Avenue. 
Um, I am an Airbnb host. I have used Airbnb as well as the HomeAway site. And my family, my husband and I, do own our home. And we've decided to go with Airbnb simply because it creates more of a community atmosphere that we have found to be incredibly um, enriching of our lives. We can't have children, and so we are maybe a little less connected to our community. And this has given us a way to actually connect more with our community through our experience. Um, we have rented both sh short-term and long-term. Um, we've met an incredible amount of people from all over the world, places that we'll never be able to travel to. We're able to, to hear their language, to, to experience their food, and we really do take part in a community aspect. Um, we believe that we are serving our neighbors and we are enriching the neighbors in our community because the housing um, market right now Many people can't afford but two-bedroom houses or um, duplexes or different things where it's been mentioned before, family members come and visit their families and they can't stay near them and it makes it more difficult on them. Currently, right now, I'm about to welcome another family of a neighbor who lives down the street and he's able to now spend more time with his family when they come to visit in one place and they unlike in a hotel room, can't meet in one hotel room altogether, and his home isn't big enough for all of them. So we are, we are, I believe, serving the people of our community as well as local businesses. And, um, and I, as far as the operator and ownership concerns, I, I am the owner. We are there, and if for some reason we're not there, we do have operators who act for us, who have access, and are within five blocks away. So I can only speak to my experiences, but they have been the most pleasant and enjoyable experiences that I've, I've had. And I've also traveled with Airbnb to other countries using their site. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kevin Gummer, and I live in the Clinton neighborhood of Southeast Portland. Um, I'm also a user of Airbnb. Um, and I've stayed in numerous Airbnb rentals throughout Oregon and Washington. Um, my fiance has stayed in them throughout the country and also over in Europe, and we both had nothing but great experiences using the site. Uh, yesterday, we started an ADU project in our basement, um, which is fully permitted through the city, um, and we hope to be able to use a new regulation to rent out that ADU to short-term rentals using Airbnb and other sites. Um, our uh, project and others like it will create a positive impact in our local economy. Um, just to consider the construction of this project, it's about $80,000 for construction. Permitting was about $4,000 in costs, and not to forget about the $3,000 we paid the architect because you need one of those. So that's a fair chunk of change right there, which hasn't been brought up tonight. We've only been talking about the fees that go to Airbnb. And all of our contractors are local, experienced contractors, and they're all licensed. Um, and we found them through talking with other people, and they're great guys. Um, we're, um, we've spoke to our neighbors about our plans uh, for doing short-term rentals, and we were surprised by the fact that they had also been interested in it too. So we're talking about combining our forces and maybe being able to use our three houses uh, to be able to support families um, that are coming into Portland. Um, we also will be dog friendly too. Um, we'll be excellent hosts and strive, and we'll strive to create a wonderful environment for our guests and neighbors through our direct involvement with our rental. With our rental, we'll be upstairs and you know we'll do our best to make sure that we've got good people in there and people like us you know we travel around and um, you know we always come in as tourists and we're there you know to spend money and and see the place and that's what we hope to bring in uh, to Portland um, our neighborhood in Southeast thank you. okay thank you <laughs> you're on a roll I know <laughs> uh, two minutes goes quick two minutes goes very quick um, questions for them Gary's Gary Gary go ahead um, for the two folks who are um, who are hosts, um, what's your reaction to the fact that there's a different regulatory scheme as to whether you're renting short term or when you pass the magic 30 day line and then you're renting long term and you're you're not regulated? Is is there any negative impact to that or any confusion or anything that arises? Um. I don't, I don't really see a, a difference that would change, you know, from 29 to 30 days. Um, but, you know, that, that's just my opinion. 
it, it is it is a bit confusing as to why there would be a difference, but you know uh, that's all I really can speak to. I guess for me, it's always about the spirit of the law instead of the letter. And so the 29 days versus 30 days, I understand why why there might be um, reluctancy against nightly visits, if you will. But um, every single one of I've I've had one. We have a two night minimum. And we've, most of the time, are, are considered still long-term even using Airbnb because most of our visitors are either relocating to the area, need a place for while they figure out where they're going to live, or they're visiting family. So grandparents will come for months at a time, like a month or so. Um, and, then, and they're reoccurring, too. We, we've been able to connect with our um, guests, and they've been coming back again, to, to visit family multiple times at our home, so. Okay, thank you. Howard? Uh, we were talking about B and a B. Uh, do you, just a quick question, do you serve breakfast? Do you, do you serve? I, we yes do, no, do no you, we do not, we okay, don't serve it. It isn't necessarily. No, we, we day. offer, we do offer, a minute, we do offer like I get it, but oatmeal, but yeah. Okay, you don't. No, <laughs> no I don't cook. <laughs> I, don't I, I won't check you out if I want a big <laughs> Catherine? Just a quick question on um, how many percentage-wise, if you had to guess, of your um, guests drive or have a car? Or Sorry, I didn't get to address that because the two minutes ran out. But yes, the parking, the majority of people that I'm finding are staying with us do not bring cars. And they, f they fly here. And in fact, they're attracted to our location specifically because of the high walkability and the access to the public transit, which they are using actively and when they people are bringing cars um, we do make sure to keep our our driveway um, available for them in our initial uh, market research we'd found that the majority of people that would be staying with us would not have cars um, so we're planning on offering bikes and then also offering the short-term uh, rental cars you know as an option to them making that information available so in our market research we had found that there would not be an influx of cars can I contribute something on that? Because since I live next door to one, I would say at least eight out of 10 people that stayed did have a rental car. And there was no designated spot for them to uh, park in front of the, the renters, uh, the Airbnb users' home. So maybe it depends on the neighborhood or the walkability or the access, you know. Yeah, we have a high walkability factor in our neighborhood. And um, there's also the max line coming in, um, which will make things a lot more walkable also. So just a question about this $80,000 investment. You must think you're going to get a pretty good return if you're putting in $80,000. I mean, I, I don't know what the ROI is for you, but. <laughs> sure. Well, it, it'll also add value to the house as being an ADU yeah. anyway. Um, I'm, I'm originally from um, the East Coast, and I plan on relocating my parents out here one day um, and, and having them downstairs in the ADU. Uh, that hopefully won't be for another 20 years, but I do have that plan in place for them. But you're, you're hoping to get the money back for 20 years. Oh, I mean, we, uh, <laughs> maybe, but we plan on being there long term. I mean, yeah. we're, we're about to start a family and get married in August, so we're going to have kids running around up there on the main floor. And I mean, we're invested in, in Southeast Portland, and we plan to be there and be a great part of the community. Okay, yeah. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have uh, four more, and then we have uh, the Airbnb wants to bring a panel. So I'm going to do the four, and then Julie, do we have any others? Okay, and then we'll do the panel, and then we'll do the last few, and we'll be done. Dean Griswold, Kim Gordon, Jason Fayen. There's another old friend I want to, I want to own. <laughs> Ready? Uh, my name is Dean Giswold. Um, I'm a 47-year resident of Irvington neighborhood, and I'm here on behalf of the Irvington Community Association. I'm on the board, and I'm also the land use chair and the uh, guy who uh, takes care of the historic district review process. Um, we're familiar with code compliance. Um, 
I live in the heart of Irvington's Airbnb uh, VBRO neighborhood. Uh, within 200 feet of my house are six units uh, rented through VBRO, at least the last time I checked. And we support, the uh, Irvington community supports this regulation as far as it goes. We, I've, I don't know if you got my testimony. You did? Okay. Yeah. We would like to see some amendments and we support, we've worked with Steve Younger and Line and the Rose. We'd like to see those amendments put forward as well. A host on site is key to making this run properly. And uh, we had complaints at a vacation rental, wouldn't have been covered by this ordinance. I happen to live on Northeast 15th, 10,000 cars a day go by. This guy lived on Northeast 15th, lived, well, actually lives in Arizona, but um, was renting the whole house. All kinds of complaints. We filed a, we filed a um, complaint with BDS. He eventually got his uh, bed and breakfast license. He got somebody on site all the time. The complaints have disappeared. Um, I do have one amendment I feel strongly about, um, and that is, uh, since it's, uh, it's code compliance is uh, by complaint driven, you're th in order to revoke a permit, you've got to show that the operator failed to comply with the regulations of the chapter. And I think the chapter needs to be beefed up to say, that it's subject to compliance with applicable city, county, and state regulations, specifically the collection of taxes and health and welfare. Uh, uh, health and welfare. Uh, right now, it just says uh, fail to comply with the regulations, and I think it says something like it may be subject to um, uh, health, um, safety, uh, other um, environmental or health regulations. It doesn't say it is subject. We all know it is subject. And, and I think it needs to explicitly say that in order to invoke uh, section, the uh, revocation of a permit, because that's how you're going to enforce it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Gordon Cumbo, and I live at 1920 Southeast Mulberry Avenue in the heart of Lads Edition. Uh, we've been running uh, our Airbnb for 16 months, and I am supportive of this amendment. It's kind of like taking the pink elephant and actually addressing it. Um, it feels good to be part of um, something that's going to be recognized. Uh, so I'm really excited. And I just wanted to uh, agree that in our Airbnb, there's only been one night when we had a family emergency when we weren't there, when we had guests there. It is our house, it is our property. My husband plays uh, saxophone. We don't know, we didn't have the opportunity to take it with us. So we felt we had to really know our guests. And I can say the term transient is really misrepresented because transient, the image that comes up is somebody on Burnside, somebody wandering around. Transient is just one term for less than 30 days. Our transient guests are grandmas, world-renowned artists, re artists in residence, ITG, website designers, osteopaths, and I, I could just keep writing the list. So we take it very seriously what we do, and we have fun. We have fun, and we're gluten-free, fragrance-free, and pet-free, and... <laughs> Television free. <laughs> so, a better than open. Yes. Yes. We, we, we stopped serving breakfast because everybody was going to Junior's, Lardo's, Screen Door, Old Wives' Tale. They did not want to eat my oatmeal and our gluten free waffles. So, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. My name is Jason Fayan. Um, I live in Southeast Portland. My wife and I operate a licensed and approved bed and breakfast there. Um, I, I've got three quick points I'd like to make. One, um, I, I actually am quite put out by the fact that um, you're considering um, allowing people to walk in <laughs> off the street and for $180 purchase a, a, a license basically to operate a bed and breakfast. Um, it, uh, it's really not something that one should undertake lightly. And um, 
after having gone through the conditional use process, which I think works and works well and is extremely necessary. Um, I, I, I just, I would urge you um, to reconsider that allowance. Um, I think it's, it's um, ill-considered. Um, the second thing that I'd like to bring up is that um, I feel the issue um, that's bringing all this to the forefront really is one of economics. Um, uh, people uh, are operating uh, under the um, anonymity provided by Airbnb, um, providing something at um, an economic advantage over those um, establishments that are, in fact, paying taxes. We paid over $22,000 to the state county and um, city last year from our establishments. Um, it seems to me that it is obvious that Airbnb should be required to provide the information for the host that they facilitate because in, fa in effect they are facilitating them to not pay their taxes. You know, I think the transient lodging there have been estimates of a million dollars a year that is going unreceived. I think that the city's efforts would be better spent getting a couple of high school interns with laptops to go through the sites with, a, with the tax maps, identify the owners, and um, require them to pay back taxes and penalties, just as any business would if you didn't pay taxes. You know, since we are above boards, we get qu audited quarterly. You know, I guess it's because we're easy targets, you know. So I would like to see that happen. I, I think that Airbnb is a particularly egregious offender in making this happen. And that's really some, a, a good starting point for the city to take. Also, I think there's no message given or no import given to enforcement of these regulations. You know, taxes are in place right now, but they're not being recorded, not being, you know, so, yeah, so I think that time and effort would be, as a starting point, would be better put towards identifying those who are operating now and bringing them into tax compliance and then deciding what to do from there. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Chris? So uh, for the woman who's a, a host, I'm sorry, I don't remember Kim. her name. Kim. Um, so an earlier testifier raised the issue that um, Airbnb should be required to display the permit number in the listing. So you know, once you have a permit and you're legal, uh, would you be inclined to display your permit number in your listing just to tell people that you are legal? Would that be a competitive advantage for you? In my residence? Or in, on in, the... On your Airbnb listing. So when people went to Airbnb, they would see that you had a permit number. Would you see that as advantageous for you? Advantageous? I I wouldn't mind it. I have a business license and a tax license, so it would just be one more thing to uh, increase my credibility. Right. That's my point. Is would you, mm -hmm. would you see that it would increase your credibility? Yeah. Can I read? Sure. Yeah, the the uh, chap on Northeast Fifteenth to which I referred. Um, if you look at his web page now, he has a prestigious bed and breakfast license. He doesn't serve breakfast, but he has the license, <laughs> so it must mean something. <laughs> Howard, we're still doing a bit. Yeah. Just a quick question for you, Kim. Do you do you feel that the inspection process seems uh, acceptable? I think it's very acceptable and fair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dean, you live on what I consider a kind of a typical Portland neighborhood street. What about traffic in these six things you know about that ex uh, six B and Bs that you know about in your neighborhood? Have you noticed an increase in <coughs> traffic or some kind of? Uh, there, there has been an increase in the. Again, I, I don't like to uh, pick on my neighbor on Northeast Fifteenth, but there are always a couple of cars uh, parked there. Uh, 15th is a busy street. It's got it's got fourplexes and apartment buildings. I mean, it's uh, parking is tight there. Uh, we haven't had any neighbor complaints. That's what uh, uh, drives this. And uh, and there's a fourplex that appears to rent out all of its apartments about 100 feet from my uh, bedroom. And uh, we haven't had any complaints there. So when there is a complaint. Um, uh, we have a guy in the neighborhood who is in charge of code compliance. We, we've got it down to a science. And I have to say BDS is, is pretty good about it, uh, getting it done. And so I think that's a real key is, is 
uh, making sure that people know how this can be enforced and the permit revoked and then stay at it because that for us has been a real lifesaver in uh, several situations. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you raised your hand, yeah. Don. Yeah. I'm having it for Don. Well, actually, I was going to ask, Dean, I was going to ask you the same question. So I'm pretty familiar with your neighborhood. It's yes, urban, you are. It's an urban <laughs> environment. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I was going to ask you about parking impacts. You're living among these facilities. I, I, not not see, only do you see a big variation. Um, and, uh, well, the building that you well know has caused a significant increase in, par in parking issues. Um, but uh, again, um, in, in my street, in my, I have a driveway. Yeah. Um, but my, the, uh, the street in front of my house always has parked cars. None of them are mine. Uh, they're uh, residents of the apartment building across the street. And there's a, a chap who is a paraplegic, and he has people come in. Sure. There's all, all kinds of circumstances. and. Frankly, from my standpoint, it's one of the advantages of living in Irvington and on, on, on Northeast 15th. And besides, I have a bus stop about 20 feet away, and I yeah. can get anywhere I want to go. So right. I'm, I like it. Great. Thanks, Dean. Um, for the two Airbnb hosts, um, you had mentioned um, that you were okay with, with your tax information, Airbnb sharing your address. Are you okay also with that? in terms of when you pay your taxes, that Airbnb would supply your address um, to the city of Portland? Well, the city of Portland already has my address. <laughs> they have mine too. <laughs> they, they, but not I with your taxes see. on your uh, property. That doesn't come across uh, from Airbnb. OK. so. The, the one problem I have with that is, is we have had people just see our house because the address is not given to guests until after they um, um, re register with us. Mm -hmm. And I've had people just from the pictures on the website come and find our house. And I also have friends who... Um, will list a property and they'll have people coming knocking on their door wanting to say can i spend the night um so i'm not sure that i would feel 100 percent com comfortable with that because i i kind of i like the anonymity as a host it feels safer to me than everybody in their next door neighbor knowing what i'm doing and where i am and and some drunk people on a friday night coming by oh look there's a airbnb we can just go flop on her on her, so no, I would not feel comfortable. This would be going to the Revenue Bureau, not to. Oh, <laughs> no, that, that, we, to we already Let me clarify. Let me clarify. Yeah. Let me clarify. They might show up. They might show up. <laughs> yeah, the Revenue Bureau. All right. In fact, report. they they don't show up. Yeah. They, that, that's part of my concern. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I just, my wife ran a bed and breakfast on Northeast 15th for 20 years. And we happened to, we were on vacation, we happened to be two weeks late with our uh, quarter, I guess it's qu quarterly or monthly payment. And the, the, the city of Portland sends out, at least they did then, one of the nastiest notes um, uh, <laughs> that you could possibly get. It scared the crap out of us. And, and it also was a 10% uh, fine if you were late, 10% of what was due. So um, uh, that's what he's talking about. If they, if they get it, it, that means whoever is supposed to pay it, collect it and pay it, is really key that because then they're getting into – uh, the tax collection process with the city, and and they mean they mean business. Go ahead. Okay. We pay transient tax, and so we're already signed up for that. Oh, thank you. So, so yeah. for us, that's not an issue. So I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, 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 no. Okay. It's fine. That's good. Thank it's you. All right. Other questions? Thank you. We will have uh, Sue Carter, Marion Bernard and Anna D. Castro, and then the um, Airbnb panel will come up. Can we take a break, or is that not? Um, these people are asking for it. No, no, um, no then we'll, we'll just, yeah. let's get through the Airbnb folks. Gotcha. Make a good time. Oh. Do I start? Yeah. Okay, go for it. <laughs> 
Okay, my name's Sue Carter, and I live in Laurelhurst, and I'm a retired educator principal. I, um, my husband and I, short-term rental for four to five months. We notified neighbors when we were doing it. We didn't know that it was illegal, and then we were, um, the neighbors, some neighbors notified this, the city, and we were shut down. Um, we like the idea in um, your proposal that we do notify neighbors, the neighbors close to us. I think that's really important. In fact, we'd be happy to send them the names of who they are and where we are, if we're going somewhere, whatever. I think that's important because it does build trust. And many of our guests would love to speak to neighbors. They love being in a neighborhood. Um, and if we have good communication with our neighbors about our rental, then we, if there is a problem like suitcase down the driveway or a car parked in front of a house, we can add it to our house rules and ensure that the, it won't happen again to the next people. I'd like to share a little bit about the kinds of renters that we had. We live near Providence Hospital. We had some families who had someone in the hospital they wanted a week to stay, couldn't afford a hotel, and wanted to be close even with mass transit to drive there. Um, we currently have a more than 30-day nurse who, she's not a nurse, she's an HR person working at Providence and goes home on the weekends, but there's going to be times throughout the year where she may need a week here or a week there to finish her project. Um, we also had a couple from the East Coast whose daughter lived a few blocks away in a rental and her daughter was getting married. She came because she couldn't stay in their house. It was a one bedroom, but she could help prepare for the wedding. And it was really important to her to be able to walk over there, help her daughter each day. Another one were grandpa new grandparents from the Midwest. They wanted to be close to their new grandbaby so they could walk over there, visit, and be in a neighborhood, not always in a hotel. Um, and then... And then your last one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so those are, are some of the kinds of guests. Um, and, and I think to um, address some of the fears, the concerns about parking, we have a long-term rental across the street that has five young people, and there's four and five cars parked. We uh, went through our guests and we had 50% not bring cars and took public transportation. Another friend of mine that couldn't be here said 40% of hers and her neighbors are recommending their friends from, and family from the East Coast to, or from the Midwest to come stay in that short-term rental across from them. So it does provide a place. Thank you. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Ana Helena de Castro. I've been a Portland resident for 27 years. I live in Lads Edition. Um, let's see. Uh, I understand that you're trying to regulate something that's already happening. Oh, wait, let me put my timer on so I know what's going on. Um, something that's already happening. There are 1,500 places on Airbnb. That's a kind of a low ball estimate. I mean, you, you have the listings. You can look at it. Um, they vary. They've gone up from, what was it, 200 in 2011. But you know all that. Um, you're trying to reg regulate something that's already happening, and I appreciate that Recap 6 is only dealing with type A short-term rentals because, as uh, was noted by Michelle earlier, more than 30-day rentals actually takes that property off the market. For people who live in Portland, and there's a housing crunch in Portland, I'm sure you're aware of it, my friends can't find places to live. Um, but you haven't been enforcing this, the law yet. I mean, all of those places on Airbnb are illegal. Um, so my, my question is, how do you plan to enforce it? I have used Airbnb for five years. I, I've had excellent experiences with Airbnb. Unfortunately, the last experience I had with Airbnb was not so good. I rented a place for my father-in-law. He came to visit me from Australia, had a new baby. Um, he lost his key one night, and I called the owner. The owner lives in New York. The owner didn't have an extra key. His maid didn't have an extra key. He was hoping that I would leave the key on the table so that the maid could get in. Um, so that's what we're looking at, is Airbnb is potentially making these places into investment properties that are then owner-occupied. How are you going to enforce that? You're not really going to enforce that. You can say you live there, and if, if they're there, great. But if they're not there for six months, that's fine. 
I have a friend right now. She lives in North Portland. I, she couldn't make it tonight. I asked her if she wanted me to say anything. She said, um, there are different people living in the house next door to her every night of the week sometimes. Um, her neighbors live in Mexico. They come back every couple of months. The neighbors probably get $3,000 a month renting their home, and they live in Mexico for most of the time. I've lived here for one year and seen them three times. I fear that my landlords will get hip and not renew my lease so that they can do the same. I very much fear not being able to afford to live in Portland much longer. My house rent is $1,400 now. That's what's happening. Um, and yes, owner occupied does make a difference. Um, there is a pink elephant in the room. I'm glad for all the people who are currently doing Airbnb, I have very many friends who do that, that they are actually getting this addressed. Thank I don't you. think Recap 6 is the place for this. But the elephant in the room is that Airbnb is bringing jobs to Portland. And we pretty much think that they've got you in their pockets. And you're not really willing to address this in the way that it needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Miriam Barnard, and I live in the Mount Tabor neighborhood. I own my home, and I am an Airbnb host, although we'll probably not be within the next 30 days because I did receive an enforcement letter from the city. Um, I think one of the things that's been really interesting for me being here today, actually, was hearing from all of the people who, who are nervous about this and who have objections. And um, it's really good as a neighbor to hear those. And I think that encouraging that neighborhood dialogue is part of what Portland is about and what, what sort of being a neighbor is about. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that strikes me is there's a lot of concern about what could happen. So far, the only things that I've heard about what have happened that have been negative was the, the lost key, which is really unfortunate. And I think most people here are in agreement that um, out-of-town investors operating vacation rentals is not what we're trying to do here, and that we're all opposed to that. Um, it does sound like the suitcase wheels on the pavement are an issue. I think that that's something that can probably be addressed. Um, and then people outside smoking or making noise. I live near an apartment complex, and every now and then there are young people out at night smoking and making noise, and they're my neighbor. So I go outside and I say, oh, hey, could you keep it down? And, and smoking's really bad for you. I encourage you to quit. But at least, <laughs> <laughs> at least don't blow it in my house. And they say, oh, sure. And they, you know, we know each other. Um, the Airbnb guests who have stayed at our house also, we had a gentleman who grew up in the Mount Tabor neighborhood, and he brought his... I think nine or 10 year old son to see the old neighborhood. We have a woman contact us who had a sick parent nearby um, having surgery and wanted to stay with us. We had some folks who were here for their family reunion, really excited to see some family members they hadn't seen in over 20 years. Uh, we had some retirees whose son lives in Eugene and they live in Seattle and it's a long drive to make in one day. So they stop by, they're, they're hoping to stop by again. Um, none of, this is our home. It is where we live. And I think that just to reiterate to other folks, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to be much more particular about who sleeps under my shared roof, <laughs> um, probably than my neighbor is. Although we definitely want my neighbor to um, know what's going on. And if there's ever any complaints, to come to us directly. The, the complaint that I got that did um, result in the city sending me a letter uh, was an anonymous, really vulgar and threatening note on my company website, actually. Um, and so if the person who wrote that note is here tonight, I just want you to know that uh, if your goal was to intimidate me and make me feel afraid, you succeeded. Um, and that I Thank hope you. that that's not how we as neighbors will continue to talk to each other. Okay. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Questions? Can I give you one statistic that came from your department, at the city, about the Ten amount of incidents? Ten seconds. Okay, it, in 2012, um, there were over 5,000 complaints to the city, and only 12 were about rentals, and none of those necessarily were about Airbnb rentals. So we need to look at the statistics to alleviate some of the fears. Thank you. That's true. So um, now we'll have the um, Airbnb panel. That will be Molly Turner, Bob Lowe, Rose Blackson, Elsie Wagner, and Ada Cardos. If you can all come up. Do we have enough on that? We need one more chair. So we're going to give you about 10 minutes to uh, 
give you a presentation and your thoughts. Well, thank you. I wasn't sure how this was going to be orchestrated, but I'll just go ahead and give you what I had prepared for this for this committee. My name's Bob Lau. I live in a lower horse community in northeast Portland. My mm -hmm. wife and I are not currently short-term renting, but however, back in 2012, we did rent short-term rental for about four or five months. And during that time, uh, we had it provided us income so that we could maintain our home and essentially retire in place. And, and also during that time, we had an opportunity to meet many nice and interesting people. For example, uh, the Nick and Fanny Hurden and their toddler son, Magnus, uh, he, Nick was a Marine officer stationed in San Diego, and he was looking forward to retirement, and he had started a, uh, a, uh, a cross-fitness gym in, in by the uh, Grand Central Bowling Alley, and he needed a place to stay other than a hotel because a hotel didn't fit their needs. They wanted to stay in a neighborhood, which maybe have somebody with a yard or maybe a nearby park. <laughs> And, and they didn't bring a car, so they wanted to stay somewhere by their, where their partner lived so you could pick them each day and take them to the gym. So we fit, we fit what they needed very nicely, and it worked out well. And in regards to what I'm hearing about the impact of the character of the neighborhood, our guests were no more intrusive than a typical neighbor's coming and going. The, typically, our guests would leave for the day in the morning, spend the day visiting family or friends, maybe attending to their business or sightseeing, and then they would return home sometime after dinner and settle in for the evening and get ready for the next day. There wasn't, what, there wasn't any parties going on. It, it's, some of the stuff is a little bit of, hype, little bit of hype. As to the economic impact of the neighborhood, our guests frequented restaurants and shops. And I'm hearing that Powell's and Voodoo Donuts were one of the prime places they went to. The, the local economy not only benefited from our guests, but we too with the extra money we re received from our that income, we were able to spend locally as well. So we're very pleased with the progress of the proposed change of the short-term rental ordinance. It's come a long way, and we, we thank you for your support. However, we are very concerned about the recent April 8th inspection re requirement amendment. As, you know, we are in, we're, we're all in favor of safety, and the space we used to provide to our guests is the same space we used to have our family spend the nights in. And we're, we believe that if it's safe enough for our family, we should be safe enough for our guests. So we, we believe that this new inspection requirement may be a big deterrent for current short-term rental hosts to voluntarily comply to the new regulations and may result with many of these hosts to continue to operate under the radar. And also, it doesn't make sense to hold these short-term rental hosts to higher standard than those hosts who have guests who stay for 30 days or more, because they're really now exempt from this inspection requirement. So we encourage the city to reconsider this new, this new amendment. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rose, and I live in Selwood, and I just want to tell, tell you a little bit about my background so that you know I'm not just someone off the street. Um, I have, I've been in the travel and tourism industry since 1979, retiring last July uh, from Amtrak after working for 15 years as the director of marketing for the Pacific Northwest. And as in that position, I was proud to promote Portland and Oregon on a regular basis. I moved here in 1997 from Arizona and purchased a home in Selwood in 2000, where I could first see a comfortable place where my family and friends could stay while visiting me. Well, they don't come and visit you quite as often when they live in Arizona and you live in Oregon, so <laughs> since the space was often empty, <laughs> especially in the wintertime, yeah. um, I decided to offer it to visitors. And knowing that I would have strangers staying in my home, I realized that I had to take additional precautions to assure that this space was safer than ever, safer than it would be for my own family. So I added a fire extinguisher, additional smoke alarms, CO2 detectors, easy access windows, special non-slip stairway <laughs> treatment, and first aid kit. And I do offer on-site parking, although I do encourage people to um, come and stay and use mass transit. In addition, I created a binder 
that tells guests everything, everything about the place and, um, and what to do in case of an emergency. So um, I must say that I've met a lot of wonderful people all over the world. I, don't, I haven't met any of these people that I've heard described tonight. Um, not once have I had a problem. These people arrive as excited as I was when I first saw Portland. They explore the neighborhood and the city, and they're eager to see all that Portland has to offer. They leave their money here. They leave their money in my neighborhood grocery stores, in my neighborhood restaurants, in my, sh in my neighborhood shops. And many, many of my neighbors have had their out-of-town family come and stay with me because they didn't have the room at their house for them. So they could be close by but still have their own space. I host their parents, their adult children, their friends and family who have arrived to be witness to a special event. You see, I'm a proud homeowner, not someone off the street, who takes special pride in my city and special care of my guests. I'm very appreciat appreciative of the commission for taking the effort to legalize our STRs and to produce simple and reasonable solutions that we can offer visitors so that we can offer visitors another affordable option to experience the city that we all love. I'm reminded of my grandmother, Rose, who lost her husband when she was 65 years old. She never worked outside of the home, so her pension would not support her after his death. She survived because she rented two of her three bedrooms to young working men who needed a place to stay and a hot meal after working in the factories. That was in the 1950s. We're not starting something new. This has been around for a long time. If her home had, had, had to be regulated the same as a hotel or a b and she would have lost her home. Today, many people, including myself, face that same, same dilemma if we're not allowed to provide the same hospitality as did Grandma Rose. So I thank the commission for helping us legalize and simplify this process so that another op option is available to our visitors. I believe that we as hosts are very responsible, so the need to be for additional monitoring by inspecting our private homes seems to be a waste of funds. <laughs> Better put elsewhere. Portland, Oregon is unique, a city that honors the leading edge innovat innovative. Let's also support them. Thank you. Um, I would kind of hurry up because your 10 minutes are going by. <laughs> I was waiting for the red light to flash. <laughs> no, I'm just waiting. I can be fast. My name is Elise Wagner, and I have been in Portland for 28 years, and I'm a self-employed artist. And that is something that you can't really say in very many cities in the U.S. Uh, and it's because of Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb has basically helped me save my house. If I did not do Airbnb, I would have been faced with foreclosure because Bank of America is so helpful with their remodification program. Uh, so as a result, and I've always used my home anyway, uh, I teach uh, art classes in my uh, studio at my house. And I always have people coming uh, for my classes from around the country and the world. And uh, this has had a double impact for me because my students can stay at my Airbnb as well. Um, I feel that uh, I'm contributing to the travel of Portland by uh, helping the economy and referring people to restaurants and all kinds of wonderful things that Portland has to offer. And my, I have parking on site. However, I'd say about 20% of my guests uh, bring cars and the rest uh, do mass transit pretty much. So um, I've had a wonderful experience. I feel as though uh, the um, inspections are kind of a ridiculous use of funds, and I, they could be better used by, by going into more different regulatory processes. So um, anyway, thank you for taking the time to listen to everyone and seeing both sides of the story. Um, I guess I'll speak very quickly. Hi, I'm Ada. I live in southwest Portland um, with my husband and my four-year-old daughter. Uh, we joined Airbnb as hosts in July of 2012 for a variety of reasons. One of the biggest is that we refinished our basement and suddenly had a lot more space than we really needed to use. So we find that doing Airbnb is an effective use of the space. We, of course, have family and friends that come and visit us. But as mentioned before, it only happens for a few weeks out of the year. So what do you do with that extra space? 
Um, we've greatly enjoyed our experiences with all of our guests, each of whom we meet upon check-in, um, even if that means one in the morning, whenever they arrive. Um, our guests have come from all over the world, bringing with them wonderful perspectives, sweet gifts, and countless handwritten thank you notes upon departure. When was the last mm -hmm. time you saw one of those? Um, demographically, our home and location tend to attract a lot of older couples visiting their brand new grandbabies and as their children move into our neighborhood, and a lot of younger people who want to check out our city and dream of eventually moving here. Um, they've, we even managed to celebrate the birth, 13th birthday of one of our guests in this particularly special moment. <laughs> oh my! Oh, <laughs> while <laughs> while her mother was tra his mother was traveling um, on an extensive trip where they, they and on a trip that they probably couldn't have had without a, a system like Airbnb set up. But I'll just leave off there since that's all the time that I have. So uh, Molly, <laughs> can you be brief in your comments? Um, so I've submitted that. written comments, so oh, okay. just leave it at that. Thank do you, you want to highlight much. a couple of things in your written comments real quick, and we'll give you that Sure, thank you. Time. I'll be very brief. I just want to thank the members of the committee for considering short-term rentals okay. in Portland and for taking the time to hear from uh, several hosts who showed up uh, this evening. I'd actually like, um, I'm here on behalf of about 1,500 hosts in Portland and about 30,000 Portland residents who use Airbnb to travel abroad. And I'd just like to see a raise of hands in the audience, the members of the Airbnb community who could be recognized. Oh, my. Oh, my. I did not realize. Um, I'll, I'll just say one, one short thing. Um, right now, this activity is not regulated. And that's why we applaud city leaders and the Planning Bureau for proposing a new policy that permits these local residents to rent their own homes on an occasional basis, of course, subject to certain conditions. And uh, we thank you for considering this. Thank you. Questions? Chris. So I have two questions for each of the hosts. Um, the first is, how many nights a year do you rent your home? Uh, and the second is, you know, a lot of the most serious concerns we've heard in testimony are situations where the host is not in the building when the guests are there. And if we made it a requirement that you be in residence, which for purposes of this discussion, I'll define it as sleeping in the house the same night that the guests are. Would that be an impediment to your short-term rentals? Um, I, I rent about uh, maybe once or twice a month uh, in, the, in the high season. In the summer, uh, it's, it's pretty much back-to-back. -back. I'm always on site. I live and work at my house, so I'm always on site. Uh, and it, it doesn't impact my community uh, all that much. As far as my neighbors, they all know sure. that I'm doing that. And Thank so. you. Um, we rent probably 15 to 20 nights out of every month. Um, and we are, we have a four-year-old and don't travel or go out. <laughs> so yeah. we're home a lot. <laughs> I just retired, so I have the opportunity to travel. So I do have a backup who's a friend of mine and does meet and greet people when I'm not there, which is not very often. Um, I also have a, a cleaning girl who's, who I call my assistant who helps people. Uh, I have a direct line to myself when, when, whenever they need to contact me. So um, I'm, I always make myself available. Um, as far as nights, um, probably it, it averages about 15 nights a month. Much more in the summertime, it's back to back pretty much because this is a summer season uh, community. Uh, in the wintertime, it's very, very little. So if we said you could only rent when you're actually there yourself, how big a deal would that be for you? That could be a pretty big deal. It took a lot of time to uh -huh. work up to retirement. <laughs> okay, thank you. And my kids are grown, so I don't have to stay home and raise them. <laughs> uh, we're not currently short term rentaling, but when we did back in 2012, I would say we probably ran about a 75% occupancy rate. And as far as being there, we're both retired. We typically would be there. However, well, I, we do expect to go places from time to time, and I can see where we'd like to have somebody be able to be house sit and be the responsible party in our absence. Okay, so Molly, I think what we heard from the folks here is that mm -hmm. They're probably at 50% or more nights they're renting. I, I think that's way above your average. So could you share what your average yeah, sure. is? Yeah, um, sure. I, I think we passed out some data um, in the blue booklet about our typical hosts. Um, all of the hosts on this panel um, 
uh, are renting rooms in their homes. Um, hosts, many of whom um, are here tonight, I believe, uh, who rent their entire homes, rent much less frequently, obviously, because they live in the home full time. And that, uh, that average day is reflected in the blue booklet. Gary? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to disclose that I did meet with the Airbnb folks um, at their invitation to receive a briefing, which I found very helpful because I was really naive about the whole market and the way it worked. But I do have a question for you, Molly, and I, sure. I think I may have asked this the other day. Sure. Can you give us some data on the, the percentage of total occupancy days that, um, that you guys brokered that comprise greater than 30 day stays versus less than 30 day stays? Do you, can you That's give an excellent question, and I don't have that data off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but that's something I would be happy to follow up with. I would say, for the most part, um, there are fewer than 30 consecutive day rentals on Airbnb, although um, there are several hosts, some of them spoke tonight, who do rent for longer than 30 days, and I think it switches back and forth depending on the guest needs. So there's relatively few long rentals. Fewer, fewer longer rentals, although Mostly some people certainly do longer rentals. You could rent, you could rent an, I've heard of landlords actually using Airbnb for year-long rentals because they find it easier than dealing with checks in the mail on Airbnb. So yeah. they, is it possible, possible for you to dig up the data on kind of where that sits, 30 and less sure, than 30? Sure, I'd be happy to. OK, thank you. Howard? <coughs> Uh, Molly, uh, it seems to me we're dealing with two issues here. One, uh, we're trying to act on behalf of any good resident of Portland that wants to make use of their facility and try to come up with a good solution. And the other is kind of you're the middleman. You're the folks that we have to deal with to get to that. And my question has to do with more of a general notion around transparency. As we go forward, uh, your company in the past has had some issues around reportage and stuff. Uh, I don't want to hold you to any one particular thing, but just get a comment from you about how willing you are to help us understand how to do this better. I think we're all in a stage where we're trying to investigate and do it as well we can. You're our partner here, and I think you have to share with us all the information you can. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, I think uh, in, in speaking with all of you um, and with several other folks throughout the city, we've demonstrated that we're really here to be helpful. Um, we really applaud um, city leaders for tackling this issue head on. Frankly, there are not a lot of cities that um, are as creative and open-minded and pragmatic as Portland has been with this issue. Um, and we would really like to be as helpful as possible to make sure that this policy succeeds. We're also committed, you know, we have an office here. We're not leaving Portland for a while and we're definitely committed to watching, um, watching as this unfolds and collaborating with whatever enforcement agencies um, we can collaborate with to make sure that this um, is truly successful. Of course, um, as an internet platform, we do um, have to protect the privacy of users, and there are um, federal laws that require us to do so. Um, we collaborate with, inf when, when, with enforcement when we can through due legal process, um, and I, 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 that hasn't been a problem with most cities. Well, it has. Except for New York today. <laughs> Actually, it has, uh, Except for New York. Full disclosure, it's been a difficult one, hasn't it? Um, not really, not oh. really. So, um, with that said, in your new updated policy, it says, for any jurisdiction in which we facilitate the collection and remittance of occupancy taxes, hosts, and guests expressly grant us permission to transfer the data and other information relating to the occupancy taxes, which you've defined up above, of any collected and remitted relating to your transactions. So. Tell me how your policy on your website, which was just updated earlier April, as you're aware, and the fact that we can't get the data asking nicely, I guess, versus New York going to court. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a lawyer, and I, I actually, I don't, I'm not very familiar with our new terms of service, although um, I will say that. Um, we are currently working with the Revenue Bureau on mm -hmm. finding a way for Airbnb to collect and remit the hotel tax. Um, we believe that's better for our hosts, it's better for the guests, and it's better for the city. Um, as part of that agreement, um, which I believe is, will be before the City Council at some point this spring or summer, um, 
it will also obviously include the ability of the Revenue Bureau to audit us and hosts um, to get the information about who is compliant and who isn't. Um, and again, we're collaborating with them on what enforcement should look like um, and providing user data when reasonable and through due legal process. So due legal process, but how do we do compliance if we don't know who paid? I mean, how do we, how do we, I, I guess from your standpoint. Well, hopefully everyone will pay because we're doing it. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> that's, that's utopia. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I can't speak to what the auditing process will look like. Um, and that's something that I know we're still sorting out with the Revenue Bureau, uh -huh. um, but would be happy to um, talk with the Revenue Bureau about that. Um, She's right there, so we'll. <laughs> would you like to speak, Terry? <laughs> we'll talk to her. <laughs> We'll get to her, yeah. I believe this is something that, that we're going to be speaking about publicly very soon once the agreement is. Um, okay. But I, I, uh, so to be clear, you're not willing today, Airbnb, as uh, and not representing the industry, but your company, to share the names and addresses of people that have paid taxes? Well, we don't know who's paid taxes well, right now. Right. But who has rented the rooms and you're paying the um, tr tax that you've collected? We haven't collected any taxes. When you do? Oh, when we will? Yeah, when you will. I, I think I, I think there's probably some solution to that, but I'm not familiar with the terms of the agreement right now, and I believe it's still um, being drafted and with the city attorney. So um, okay. I can't comment on that, but okay. sorry. It is important to note that not all short-term rentals are Airbnb. That's so no, I'm many, just looking at industry. Many of the yeah. industry, you go directly to the owner. owner. Yes. And so that will involve an entirely different way Wait, yeah. um, to be able to collect the taxes that I think mm -hmm. maybe For any Revenue Bureau could also address potentially. I, I you just, are correct. Maybe I should clarify the way this tax collection is going to work. Um, it's not an option. It's a fee that Airbnb is adding on every room night in Portland. So everyone who uses Airbnb will be fully compliant because we're going to be adding the tax. And as the industry leader... Hopefully others will follow. Unfortunately, yeah. not all platforms not all facilitate the payment, so they can't all do it. Okay. Thank you. So I have a follow-up question yes. uh, for Molly. Uh, and I... Also met with Molly uh, last week briefly. Um, yeah, I had not used your service before. I, I've used uh, VBRO uh, or VRBO, um, but I have a trip coming to Seattle in a couple of weeks, so I, I used your service to see what the experience was like, uh, and was impressed that you know you offer a lot of ways that I can improve my credibility to look more attractive to hosts, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, the topic's been raised earlier tonight about displaying permit numbers. Um, you know, would you see Airbnb adding that as a feature to facilitate hosts adding their permit numbers so that they can have more credibility with renters? Absolutely. In several jurisdictions already in, throughout the world, uh, that's a requirement, and hosts are able to list their permit numbers uh -huh. on their listing page. I don't see why that would be any different here. Okay. Thanks. Um, Full disclosure, I met with Airbnb too. I, I, it's just that who all <laughs> met with Airbnb, so I don't know. So. I didn't. Yeah. So, um, time. other questions for the time. panel? I, um, I have one question for the hosts. Um, do you all own your own homes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, that's a question for you, Molly. It says in your literature here that 84% of people in Portland are renters? Um, so the 84% of Airbnb hosts, uh, according to a survey that we recently conducted, are renting out their primary residence, whether they are the whether they own it or they're the tenant. In that primary residence, okay. it's the home that so they that, live in. So those aren't renters per se? No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, in interest of time, I would like to just press on. If people need a five-minute break or so, or do you want to just keep going? All right. Um, Julie, are there any more 
testimony. At this time, I'm going to, anybody else would like to testify about the short-term rentals? Any other, um, have you filled out a card? Okay, um, give Julie your card and come up. Come on down. And take a seat. Thanks, John. I, I need your card. She wrote, she wrote her name. She wrote. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll leave it with you. Just, just it leave it with okay? Julie, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to respond to some things that were being said. Use the mic. Thank you. And remember, you have two minutes there. Okay. And your name. And your I'm, name. I'm Jerry, and I'm a host. Oh, no. I, I live at six. That was a joke about AA, but that's not funny. I live at 65 Northeast Graham, and I am, and I started hosting this February. Go ahead. And um, I just wanted to add a couple of two points that, uh, in response to what who was speaking tonight, um, I have rented out my house for uh, my extra bedroom for four years, for a long term, two different people, and um, because they were living there, they needed a kitchen, so they shared our family kitchen. And that got um, complicated. My husband is, um, in, he had triple A aneurysm rupture, and so it made it real complicated for our family to have someone eating in our, using our storage. So um, Airbnb is a better solution for us because our guests don't eat in our kitchen. They don't use our kitchen to cook. They um, so so far I've only had one guest and she stayed um, from February through last week, coming to town to look for a place. So um, I don't have short-term people yet, but a father is coming Friday to visit his son, and I have a medical student signed up to come the next month, and she's going to stay for a month. I live near Emanuel Hospital, so it's very convenient for her to walk down the street. So, um, and the other uh, point I wanted to make from what I heard tonight was that I don't work for Airbnb. I use them as a service to advertise my home. I ac actually planned to do it on Craigslist, but then I found my friend did it with Airbnb, and it's a lot more convenient for me. I don't have to worry about credit card um, or getting paid or my guests having to bring whatever, which I, um, uh, okay. So that they're a service just like the service I have for a, a young woman who comes and cleans my house um, twice a month or every other week. So it's it, I don't work for them. They're helping me and they're helping me do things that would be very difficult for me to do so thank you thank you sir your name yeah my name is david ivy i'm an airbnb host in hawthorne neighborhood um, i've been hosting for about four or five months now and i'm not the owner of the property i have a lease on the property um, the owner of the property is an old friend we've been friends for 25 years he likes to visit Portland eight or nine, ten times a year for a week or two at a time. So my hosting on Airbnb has allowed me to pay the mortgage on the house, keep it out of foreclosure, save the ownership for his, essentially for his daughter's legacy. And, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm the primary renter. I have a long-term lease from the owner. And I've had nothing but wonderful experiences with all of my guests. Um, I've had guests from all over the world. Um, right now I have a physicist uh, family visiting their son who just had a child. Um, I would say 40 to 50% of my guests are family, visiting family in Portland. Or then there's the Portlandias that come to visit. And they're <laughs> couples, artists, people from all over the country and all over the world. I had two psychiatrists from London visit who were crazy about Portlandia and wanted to see all the weird stuff in Portland. 
And I've just had a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful time. Psychology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had a wonderful time hosting people from all over the world. They spend money in my neighborhood. They have a wonderful time. They rarely bring rented vehicles. When they do bring a rented vehicle, I give them the driveway and I park on the street. Um, there is no density impact to speak of. It's a three-bedroom house. I live in one of the bedrooms. I rent one, and I've never rented two bedrooms at the same time, but I rent one or the other bedroom. Um, they use the kitchen. We cook together. Uh, oh, all of my neighbors are aware of what I'm doing, and uh, I've given them my phone number, contact information. I want to commend planning staff for an incredibly intelligent, fair, and good um, draft of these proposed rules. Um, I think maybe the inspections are, may not be necessary for houses that are permitted and have already been inspected as built. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and the taxes, I'm perfectly willing to pay taxes. Great. Thank you. Questions? Uh, we have one more. Tim Kerr. Did you... Mm -hmm. yeah. Have a seat. Uh, good evening. My name is Tim Kerr. I live in the Kearns neighborhood. I occupy and own a duplex, rent out half of it, live in the other half. Uh, recently, the last month and a half, two months, I've been started on Airbnb. I've had a phenomenal experience thus far. Out of the last four people, only one person has had a car. Of the four, two have been from Japan. And that's partially due to my background, having spent seven years in Japan. I'm trying to target Japanese travelers to come to Portland. And when they arrive, I can guide them around Kern's neighborhood, take them up and down 28th, pointing out the restaurants and bars. So together, often we eat at the restaurants, shop, you know, locally. So my experience thus far has been really, really good. And all my neighbors know what's going on. I've had such a good experience, I'm willing to let my tenants underneath me. If ever one was to be gone for a while, if they wanted to use Airbnb, I would be, you know, ecstatic if they wanted to do it. So the proposals you've put forth, I think, are great. Sure, I would love to pay, you know, add the 12% tax. Great. $180 a year? Great. So, yeah, thank you very much for your well-thought-through proposal thus far. Thank you. Sir? My name is Cole Peterson. Um, I live in the Alberta Arts District. Um, I'm kind of in a unique position. I actually own a hotel, and uh, we use Airbnb as a platform, but that's kind of incidental to my comments. Um, my comment is basically there isn't enough supply of commercial hotel accommodations to meet the amount of demand that we have in this city, and I haven't really heard anybody address that. So I, would, I just wanted to raise that as a point that there, there simply is too much there's too much tourism, and there isn't enough places to stay in the summer at this point. And every hotel and every Airbnb is booked. And um, you know, if we're you know we're we're going to lose those people who are coming to Portland if we don't have accommodations for them. So I'm I'm supportive. I'm fully in support of this proposal. I think it's great and pragmatic and realistic. There's a lot of an economic gain for individuals as hosts as. Um, there's a lot of economic game for the local community and the local economy. And most importantly, um, people who are coming to visit Portland want a, a lot of people, speaking as somebody who deals with literally hundreds of people visiting Portland, are coming for um, a unique experience of Portland to get to taste you know, some of the best like food cart food and best craft beer in the world. And they don't want to stay in Motel 8 on a commercial district in you know, Vancouver. They want to stay in a cool residential neighborhood, and they can't do that right now because there isn't that kind, those kind of places don't exist other than through self-hosted or hosted vacation rentals through platforms like Airbnb. It's not just Airbnb. Thank you. So, thank you. We have one more, Louisa Zeller. Is there anybody else? <laughs> going once, going twice. Sorry, I, is there anybody else for short term? <laughs> no. Go ahead. I just wanted to reiterate what what I've heard so far. Um, I'm a host. I ho I live on NATO Parkway. I also have a property uh, that I ran out through Airbnb by OHSU. 
all of the guests that I've had in my home have been uh, wonderful, thoughtful, considerate. Um, they're not transient troublemakers that are cause, you know, causing riots in in the neighborhood. Um, I just wanted to make that very clear. I've been doing it for since 2011, and um, respectful. Uh, if they're not, I would leave a comment about them not being respectful. So they do need to show some sort of uh, consideration <coughs> to the people that they're staying with. Um, because if they get a lot of bad comments from hosts, nobody will want to host them. So um, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anybody else? <laughs> Close. Close. Going Close. once, twice. twice. So. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, <laughs> you stop there. All right. Yeah. Give your card <laughs> to Julie. Because everyone has. And tell us your name. James Knight, uh, resident of Northwest Portland. Um, the one thing for me that I'd want to bring out is, because um, there's a lot about Airbnb here, but for me, the point about it being, uh, as a user, and as somebody who's rented it out, um, the business is, is us and not Airbnb. To me, that's a service that makes it easier and more user-friendly, particularly the vetting process, because the hosts are reviewed and the people who come are reviewed. And it gives you, as a host, a way to vet <coughs> the kind of people who come in and vice versa. And I think that's in a huge factor here that's really important because this is going to happen whether Airbnb is here or not. People are going to find a way to use some system to get <coughs> short-term rentals, probably underground. But to me, this brings it into the light of day and um, actually makes it cleaner, cleaner, and, it, and I think the vetting process is a very significant factor here. Okay. That, um, and it's, yeah, to me, it's not about them. And yeah, people make money by it. And there's a lobby here that probably a hotel lobby or something that maybe sees it as a competition. So you could put that argument either way. I am, to me, Thank it's you. the fact that we have this, that we're supporting the shared economy and we're decentralizing an opportunity for somebody to participate in an economic adventure. Um, I think that's a really healthy thing, and I think that's a very Portland thing. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony. <laughs> Nobody else. So testimony is closed. Public testimony is closed. We'll have staff come back up. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Sandra? <laughs> Come back, Sandra. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for coming with me. And Julia. So our to be planner. efficient, why yeah. don't we just start and go around the room and ask questions that you may have. And good. Good, way. good way to do it. So I guess one question. initial comment I'll have Excuse is. Excuse me. Go ahead. One, just a quick point. Yeah. Will the staff be able to give us their observations on the testimony also while we're, while we're doing this? Yeah. I, okay. I would. Want to right. do that first? You want to do that first? Sure, I can do that first. Because okay. it might answer some of the. Is that yeah. okay, Michelle? Okay. Um. So, um, let's me see. Let me. Where do we start? Um, let me start with reiterating. I think what Susan was saying that this isn't a zoning code recommendation specifically for Airbnb. There's obviously other platforms, whether it be internet platforms or you're sticking a sign outside your house saying "room for rent here." Right. Um, so that's the first thing that I wanted to make sure we all knew about. We're also um, talking about amending the zoning code, and the zoning code is a land use regulation. So we really want to tie what our requirements are with the land use impacts. We know we have other goals in the city um, as far as um, you know, collecting the taxes and 
the type of companies we want to do business with and how local we want to keep things, but we're within the confines of the zoning code, so we want to really be thinking about those land use impacts and differentiating between one type of use versus another one. Um, those are to my overall comments. Um, I think there were a lot of testimony. I was kind of keeping score score here. I don't know if score is the right word. Um, and there was certainly a lot of testimony about this is a major policy change, um, not a minor policy change. And um, you know, I know the planning commission um, actually we held a hearing on whether this should be on recap six or not. We heard considerable testimony last August when we were putting this on the table to be discussed, um, and we were all in agreement through that public hearing that this would be the right avenue for that. So that's just an observation and something I wanted to share with the public. There seems to be um, several points being made tonight about. Um, kind of three things that are very related to each other. One is whether the host should be on site. Um, the other one is owner occupancy was thrown out a lot, interdispersed with the host being on site, and people seem to use those terms interchangeably. So if we want to have that discussion, we'll need to be specific about which one we mean. Um, the other one is um, defining primary residence. I only heard this actually spoken about twice during this conversation, but I know some of the commissioners had questions about that too. All three of those related to item number one on the purple sheet. So if we take a look at the purple sheet, I think um, there was considerable testimony about number one, which is the host, owner occupied, etc. cetera. Um, not, much, not any testimony on the building types. Some testimony on the bedroom requirements, specifically from the Airbnb panel saying uh, maybe um, inspections shouldn't be required. And um, so there was some testimony along that. Um, process, certainly, the, um, there are people who aren't feeling that a uh, by right permit should be, um, is the right level of review and that conditional use review either should still be on the table or not. I wasn't quite sure about that. And I think the rest of the items we didn't hear very much about. So it's really number one is the number one issue, um, and possibly number three um, and four for the commission to discuss. I don't know if that answers any questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mainly that. wanted to hear your reaction to the testimony before Michelle started asking some questions. Um, I think we heard most of these issues during our seven week period of public comment and that's what we were where we came to the conclusion with the proposed draft that we have before you trying to weigh um, the pros and cons of each of these issues okay so so a couple of questions slash comments in terms of treating it in recap um, definitely heard the comments that maybe this is too big an item for recap mm -hmm. I go back to the fact that this is already allowed under the code mm -hmm. as a conditional use and my memory of the discussion was the consideration of maybe if you're only doing one to two bedrooms, the conditional use permit in eight to 10 weeks and $4,000 may be too much. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is not allowing something that's completely new mm -hmm. in the code, but regulating the smaller impact uses in a different way. So that's how I see it fitting within the recap structure. Um, I think it also makes sense to treat it as a home occupation, but in my mind, it also makes sense to have some sort of home presence associated with that. If it is a home occupation, then I, I would like to see us figure out some way to have some sort of monitoring there, whether it's the person or when I'm on vacation, you know, a short vacation. I don't know how we phrase that, but having some sort of person to contact if there is a problem makes sense to me. And I'm not sure how that works out. I mean, I don't think the person should have to be in their house 24 hours a day because they rented it out, but I'd like to hear what people think about how to manage that part of it. Uh, I would like to see um, the definition expanded to include domestic partnership, okay. which I had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it shouldn't be limited to the owner of a house, that if you rent the house, and I assume that when you give the notice that's required, you have to give notice to the owner if you're not the owner. Is that correct? Or would you not? Attorney. Um, is that how it works? No. I I, I, not. I don't believe that would be a requirement 
then I, that would be something it's else, I think. Form, but I'm not sure what so when you fill out a land use application now, do you have to have the owner no, sign it? No, only for land divisions. Okay, then that would be land something Land divisions else, is I the only one that the state requires a property owner signature for everything else, including a zone change. There's no property owner signature. Okay. So you would, what, what was the last one? I didn't hear it. Um, I was just trying to understand how that was going to work because I like the idea of you not having to own the house to be able to do this. And so but, I was trying to understand how the owner, does the owner okay. know about it? Because I don't want to insert the city into your your lease or into your mortgage. I don't think that's right, right. Yeah. the area we need to get into. Mean occupy. Right. Okay. I don't, some of what we were hearing was, you know, it has to be owner occupied and the owner yeah. needs to be there. And I think if you're the renter, then you should still be able to take advantage yeah. of this. I see what you're saying. So. Okay. Mike. Well, yeah, I've heard assertions that this would lead to some sort of, you know, scheme where people would just start investing and we'd lose the housing stock in the city. I, I didn't hear any evidence of that, and we've got somebody who may, maybe can comment on that. I'm, I was just curious. Um, I should have asked this question, I guess, when Airbnb was up, wh whether there's any data that supports that assertion, that there's a loss of housing stock because people are converting <laughs> just investing to be able to do this? Um, so we haven't found any data that people, um, that the housing stock is being um, being lost. We also feel that with this proposal, because it requires that it be the primary residence, right. that that's covered, that concern is covered by that. Then the only, I'll get back to my noise issue, because that's, a, I live in Northwest Portland, parking's a big deal, I may have to park two or three blocks away from my house. I have no problem with that. So the parking, to me, is not, an issue. Noise would be, and I know, uh, again, the noise ordinance officer is now in ONI and not in BDS, so I would just be interested to know how the coordination would occur um, so that if you do wind up with, mm -hmm. with complaints related to noise, how that's going to be handled. Well, BDS, it, what the noise office and noise program was a portion for the last seven years as part of BDS enforcement. So um, we, we do maintain good communication when there's crossover complaints now that they're split and they go to different offices. In, in our experience, most of the noise concerns that would probably be lodged for a short-term rental would not be subject to the city's noise ordinance. They'd be human voices, um, not regulated. It'd be a matter for um, police, not emergency. Um, disturbance of the peace, perhaps, for an officer to just come talk to people. Um, but very, it's very unlikely that there would be a citation issued by a police officer for the typical disturbance that we'd have um, late night. Car doors slamming, the, the suitcase being <coughs> rolled down, which is it's, it's an impact. You can argue that it's noticeable, but it's not really subject to an ordinance that the city has in place at this time. Mm -hmm. I just keep asking about inspections. Um, one last question on that, hopefully. Uh, did you guys consider third-party inspections instead of having it run through BDS directly? We heard that uh, suggestion, um, and we thought about it. Um, first of all, uh, we're, we're not supportive of third-party inspections. Um, we, we don't believe that you're going to have greater consistency. I think BDS can provide the consistency that you're looking for and that there's concerns um, without having that consistency about narrowing the scope of that inspection. Um, I, I could, the city, the city's also in contract negotiations at this time and uh, third party uh, inspections are not something that's part of the bargaining currently so BDS will not entertain that at all at this time. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Other questions? Here's your code. So I have um, some observations and questions. So yeah, the question of whether this should be in recap six. Um, yes. you know, if, we, if we were redoing the scope right now, I might say not. Not because I think this didn't get enough airing through this process. I think the fact that we've had this, all this testimony tonight proves it does. I think it probably did damage to the rest of the recap six package getting sufficient public attention. So, uh, but that ship has sailed. Uh, but you know, next time around, I'll give some consideration to that. Um, you know, on the inspection issue, we're going to figure out pretty quickly 
um, how many you know, non-legal bedrooms we find in the process. If, if it turns out to be a de minimis amount, uh, how quickly and how easily could we remove the inspection requirement if, if it turns out it's not generating any value? It'll be a full legislative process again. Uh -huh. So we'd we be to, back before the commission be, be recap sharing what our results are, <laughs> right? <laughs> sharing what our results are Seven and point. make Seven. a recommendation to city council, yeah. Okay. We'd also, we, we'd also, BDS would also like to suggest that, you know, things do change over time, mm -hmm. even after that first inspection. Uh, we've had actual enforcement cases against short-term rental where um, illegal spaces have been found. Okay. And that's, that's been part of what the yeah, public sure. was, was sleeping yep. in. Mm -hmm. um, we've had situations where the current owner wasn't even aware of it. It was done uh, by a previous owner. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not always true in our experience that the current owner does know what's legal in their own, in their own home. Yeah. We also find that there are, are minor changes that you, know, you hire the right person and they do it, but those wall heaters in that space, in that bedroom upstairs, without the right electrical inspections are hazardous, mm -hmm. are, are not approved. And that's what we think could happen after that initial inspection. So changes can be made. Mm -hmm. There could be feedback from guests or amenities added mm -hmm. um, to make the space more enjoyable. And that, that's what we're concerned about, just making sure that those minimums at, at some level are, continue to be met. Okay. Um, so there was a question raised in, in, in testimony about um, you know, knowing who's a host. Um, and I, I assume that it's a matter of public record who has a permit, right? So once a permit is issued, so they, you can find out who are the permitted homes in Portland. Is that correct? That's correct. So the permit would be in our per permitting system with an address attached right. to them. Okay. Um, you know, I guess one simple thing that it might help some of the neighborhood contact stuff would be if it would be adding a requirement that the, uh, the permit or some variation of it with a f contact phone number be displayed at the entrance of the home that's being used for short-term rentals. Do you see any yeah, advantage, disadvantage to doing that? Issue. Pardon? Chris, that, that really might be a security issue, to post that in a place that's visible to the public, from my okay. perspective. Posting it inside the house, good idea. Right, well, the point is, if a neighbor's having an issue, that there's a phone number the neighbor can call. Right. Yeah. So making that phone number so maybe, publicly displayed. So our thought was that that would be covered with a noti notice uh -huh. that was going out so anyway, that that would be required in case of you know, emergency. Here's the contact information. Does that notice happen at renewal as well as the initial permit? Yes. Okay. So it does. All right. And that's one of the main purposes for requiring the renewal is that uh -huh. the new neighbors are notified of the activity. Right. Um, even okay. if they missed the last Great. notice. Thank you. Um, so... Sandra, again, this is an issue you and I talked about briefly, um, privately, but Dean Gisvold raised the issue of having the criteria include compliance with other regulations so that failure to, you know, to be a good citizen and be compliant with those things could become uh, a basis for revocation of the short-term rental permit. Um, you want to share the answer with it, uh, that you shared with me on that? Could you repeat that? So. Dean, who was testifying on behalf of the Urban Community Association, uh, oh. said that we should include other compliance with other regulations as a basis of issuing the permit, and so that if somebody was habitually violating those regulations, we could have that as a basis for revoking the permit. Uh, I know you guys weren't wild about that idea. If you, we just have a little brief discussion about that. Right, and we we did talk about um, the fact that the, in the in the um, in Title Three. It says in the, that, um, and, I, and I actually want Mike to add to, to this too, that, um, that you, it would be revoked if it, if it wasn't meeting the regulations in the new chapter. Uh -huh. And um, we um, typically, this is, uh, don't put those kinds of um, regulations in um, the zoning code because uh -huh. it's the land use um, uh -huh. um, section of the, of the city. And so we felt comfortable um, not, putting, not putting it in. Mike, did you want to add to that at all? Like, cause, because partly it would be like BDS would be in a position where all of a sudden they were going to be regulating OLCC laws or Multnomah County health laws. Right, and that's we're not really, based on our resources, we're not in a position to do enforcement for other agencies. Um, we, we can look at trying to do the best with the resources right. for the new language in the zoning code and with the safety inspections, but right. tax and collections, think, those types of things, yeah, we're so not in a position to, 
make a decision on. That's the distinction I want to get to, because I think I'm not looking for you to enforce those codes, but if you were made cognizant by OLCC that somebody was in violation, that you could use that to revoke the short-term rental permit. There also has to be a nexus. If somebody gets a speeding ticket, do we revoke their short-term rental permit? It, there has to be, again, getting back mm -hmm. to what zoning and the land use laws right. require. Well, that I mean, there I is think a the nexus direct. is impact on neighbors, right? So if, you know, if we define in this chapter what those regulations are that, ha that, you know, that do have an impact on neighbors, isn't that a sufficient nexus? It could be a sticky wicket. It is a sticky Chris, wicket. Chris, could, could I ask you to, because I'm having trouble tracking you know, uh -huh. with these, what these other regulations might be. Uh, well, you know, I'm I think serving it's alcohol. good that it's all encompassing, but. Can you give me an example of a of a if a home rents a room out and there's not a there's just the B, not the the other B, mm -hmm. the breakfast and everything else? Right. What what other rules kind of might come in play that you're 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 contemplating? Well, I think Dean had a specific list in his letter, and unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me. But, yeah. Um, I, OLCC was one, so serving alcohol. Okay. Right. So okay. If you served alcohol and didn't get a license and didn't comply with all the OLCC yeah. terms, yeah, you could have your permit for short term rental revoked. Okay. Okay. So are you thinking that there should be a cross-reference of some kind? That's what Dean was suggesting. Yeah. Dean didn't actually have, um, he just said, he just, um, he just uh, talked about city, state, mm -hmm. and yeah. county. I don't think yeah. he had he a did. list. Okay. It was of, very vague. Yeah. yeah. Right. So one thing we don't want to do, we don't want to use the zoning code to um, do too many cross-references to other mm -hmm. state, county, and everyone else's rules because as soon as the rules change then we have to come back and amend our rules so we felt what we were being covered by this issue by saying maybe subject to other county and state requirements just giving people a extra customer service heads up um, about this right okay um, so that gets me to I think my two main issues so uh, one scenario that was called out in testimony is the idea that you know someone might essentially a property owner might install a tenant who is there only to be the primary resident for purpose of operating short-term rentals. Uh, and that that would, so you know, instead of renting to, if you have a three-bedroom house, instead of renting to a family of four, you rent to a single individual who then rents out two rooms on your behalf. Um, you know, it's certainly it's possible under the regulations simple. we created. I guess I don't see it as likely. And you know, I'm, I'm reminded that back you know, a decade ago when we first uh, sort of liberalized ADUs, you know, uh, I heard testimony at that time. I was on the neighborhood side then, but I heard testimony that you know this was going to change the character of whole neighborhoods. And, well, that was what I was doing. Right, and so I, yeah, yeah I guess <laughs> I see that I see that that path exists. I guess I, I'm skeptical that that's going to be you know, what would really happen in any volume. So I'll just put that out there. Um, but then I, I think the main point where I'm interested in hearing what my fellow commissioners think is, you know, would making it a requirement that the host be in residence and for purposes of session, I'll say in residence means sleeping in the house the same night that the guests do, um, you know, put a buffer around some of the significant concerns that we've heard. So I'm, I'm interested in that possibility. I'm not suggesting an amendment right now, but I'd love to hear what my fellow commissioners have to think about it. And I'll pass it along. Should I, I'd like to respond. Go ahead. Well, it's fresh in my mind. Otherwise, you know, it may go away. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, I think the word host is good, and I agree with your, your intent. I think if, uh, you know, and I'm glad Michelle identified this, if we start kind of labeling owners right. of properties, it seems like it, we're discriminating. And I think the real function, and what I heard from people, is they want a host there that's consistent, that stays there, that's someone they can call. Uh, I think you're on to the right, uh, I too. The right label, Chris. I too. So does that, Michelle, does that yeah, sync I with what... Chris is saying? It does, in terms of there being some somebody you to go to. Consistent. Just being consistent with, in terms yeah. of it being a home occupation, being a home occupation and not being in the home. Does it have to be the primary resident, or could it be a, an assistant, as somebody used the term tonight? I think a sub. I think it seems more like if we're staying consistent with the home occupation, I guess I'm Substitute seems to make more sense if you're not allowed to have an employee. So it's figuring out how this lines up. I don't want to tie. I don't want to tie somebody to their house. Like you can never leave mm -hmm. if they can find somebody to take their place. But I'm not trying to make it a revolving door. So it's right. that struggle mm -hmm. of how do you how do you enforce that somebody's there? You don't. 
so I mean, to me, it's 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 kind of tied to, and I like where everyone's going. You know, it's a primary residence. Mm -hmm. It could be the renter who's who's kind of their primary residence or the owner. Um, and I think that covers most of it. And you know, so you leave one night out of the fifteen you rent that month. I mean, how do you enforce? You had to be there, and so I just don't think you can go there. I don't either, because the primary residents going to take a vacation every now and then. <laughs> sure. Exactly, mm -hmm. and so they're going to have someone substitute for them. But someone on site is not a bad idea. Uh, I agree. Someone, someone being there or being accessible to there is a very important part of this piece, I think. Right. Well, I mean, we certainly don't want to prevent people from taking vacations, but can we say, well, you can't do a short-term rental while you're on vacation because you have to be there but to you supervise can have the rental. There. That's what I mean. Well, yeah, because I was thinking of Rose, you said so. I, so. I guess I go back to, though, how do you even know that they've hired somebody to sleep in the or asked a neighbor to sleep in the house for the night? I, I mean, I guess you don't. Well, you don't. I, I guess you, 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 make, you know, it's like, how do you say, you better go 40 miles an hour, we'll give you a ticket. Okay. Uh, hold on. <laughs> so you so can that. The, the, the critical issue here, it, it sounds like, just listening, is that how do you maybe it's how do you enforce it? Because I, I think there's agreement, you, someone ought to maybe be there, but how do you enforce that they're there? And if you write code language, how do you, right. how do you know they're there? And secondly, I guess, you know, Andre, my thinking is, is enforcement's a whole nother thing. First of all, we need to kind of write the regulation and have people sign up and register, right? And do the inspection. And then if there are complaints about that certain host or operator or whatever, at least you can hold up a paper that says you're not complying. We're going to revoke your registra registration or whatever, right? So it's step one. Okay, go ahead, Gary. You know, I think we're jumping to an enforcement place here. And the reality is for something like this, which is you know fundamentally a benign civil activity, is that most people are going to comply with the regulation if they know what they are. Yeah. And so, you know, I think if we have something there about the operator or a substitute agent or something like that and just creating a clear legal expectation, um, that probably goes 95% of the way yep. to solving the problem. There's always going to be people who, are, who get into a regulatory situation, but I think we can minimize that. Okay. All right. Howard, your comments. Uh -huh. Well, I guess I want to start by reminding us all we're looking at this through the lens of the Portland plan and how it affects our city. And I want to remind us that uh, I read everything that, that Andrew. Okay, okay. And the word and the word in the Portland plan that resonates for me is equity. And I believe we're trying to produce equity here and allowing people to use excess rooms in their house for very good and intelligent reasons. There's something in between that called a large institution that's going to regulate that, and, and that's a whole is separate issue for me. But um, I have a couple questions. Sandra, why did you eliminate Neighborhood Watch? I think that's a real critical part of the whole piece in kind of seeing how the neighborhood operates. Why didn't you include them in the, in the uh, notification of, of this whole thing? Can I, can I um, answer that? So um, Neighborhood Watch is part of, um, it's the crime per, um, um, prevention specialists in, within the coalition offices. So when the notification goes out, it goes to the no, the, um, the the offices, and it might go. And you know, it, for I can't say for sure it goes to the crime prevention specialist, but it could. And then they um, could send it on to the neighborhood watch. Now we also got a letter from Southeast Uplift's um, crime prevention specialist. Um, actually, it's in your testimony. And she was very supportive of Neighborhood Watch as a way to, you know, not that that it's not that we that we're afraid of strangers in our neighborhoods. We just want to um, be able to kind of know what's going on in the neighborhood, and that Neighborhood Watch could actually be a good thing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. could help. Um, like the Neighborhood Watch could know where the short-term rentals mm -hmm. are in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and then and might might it not be a detriment? Right. Might they say a suspicious person's in the neighborhood when they're really a renter at a B and B? Right. I mean, it seems oh, to me absolutely. that uh, yeah. it's an automatic that that on the ground watching my neighborhood all the time force should be aware of people that are legitimately in the neighborhood mm -hmm. renting a room. Yeah. So I, I just make that case. Uh, I do believe there should be on someone on site all the time. I echo almost all the things you're saying, Michelle, so I don't have to mm -hmm. 
repeat that. Um, let's see, what am I leaving out here? Oh, insurance. But we've talked about that. It is kind of an interesting and intriguing thought. Uh, I don't think most insurance companies would be thrilled about this whole people coming and going thing. I don't know that, but could we have an answer to that? And then lastly, I'm worried about, and I think you're sitting on a very hot seat here in terms of reality of inspections. So you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm as worried as these guys are about overzealousness, overprotectiveness, or just plain crankiness on the part of an individual uh, that could result in somebody having a real bad issue in their house that they weren't expecting as a result of renting a room. We hope not. We're going to try not. Give me some assurance you're going to do everything you can, given you're having to sit in that seat there and answer it. Uh, that there won't be overreach in, in this inspection service, because that's really a concern. Well, the enforcement program, the enforcement program currently completes investigations on a daily basis for all of these issues. And we go in, um, we focus on what the concern is at any level, and we see where it takes us. Um, we consider all the, the facts, all the issues, and try to make a reasonable determination on, on what needs to be done if there's an issue of noncompliance. The focus is on compliance. Um, so when we're talking about many of these scenarios where we found something illegal, there's a path to making it legal. So it, it's not that it's just prohibited. It's just that it may not have had benefit of permits or safety requirements right. that, that we require other people to meet currently when they right. come proactively ask for a permit to do something. So it, it's, it as a matter of fairness, it's, it's right in that ballpark. Um, our inspectors are dealing with problems that are inherited by fourth owners. It's quite a surprise to them. And we're, we're skilled at, at going through the process and helping people get legal. Um, our bureau had a get legal program. We're thinking as we're rebuilding of restoring that program for these types of situations. We know they're difficult to deal with. Yeah. The enforcement program is not your, your, your building department permit inspection agency. We're investigators, we're, we're code experts, and we work with people on a different level. We're not just responding to permit inspections that are, are blindly called in on any given day and somebody you know, may have, a, we, we all, possibly have bad days, I'm sure. Uh, but we, we focus on customer service, and we focus on our mission, which is really to help people get into compliance. And that's, that's the mantra of the enforcement program. And I would just add that I heard lots of great things about BD and for, BDS enforcement tonight. So <laughs> I wasn't calling it down. I was just asking to give me a sure shirt. Not. My pipes are legal. That's all. I heard several comments. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Andre's left the room. Let me assume the Absolutely. chair and call on you. Oh, go ahead. Gary. <laughs> um, this has been an interesting process for me, and I've had more and more questions at a policy and operations level as I've gone on. But let, let me focus in on um, the inspection part of this. And um, one of the things I think I heard you say, and again, I'm really deaf, so pardon me if I got this wrong, but I thought I heard you say that with regard to inspecting for legality of bedrooms, it's more an art than a science. And mm -hmm. I find that really concerning. Um, you know, I come from a 25-year background um, being the chief physician over inspections over in the county for health reasons. And I think for an inspection program to be valid, there needs to be an underlying situation that we're trying to find on a systemic basis. And what I'm concerned about here is we've got, this is sort of a, a random implementation of inspection where if you happen, if you happen to, to be a, a short-term renter um, host, you get inspected, you find there's a defect that's found in a bedroom, which is more art than science, um, and then you're down a compliance and or regulatory pathway for something, as you acknowledge, may well have been done by the fourth previous owner. And if the intent is to improve community housing stock overall, that's not the tool you would use. That's really a random tool. There have been other communities. I use my mother's suburb in, outside of Minneapolis as an example. Where houses turned over, they had to be brought up to compliance for certain safety code issues uh, as a condition of sale. I, I would not advocate for that. 
But if you really want to do it systematically in terms of improving housing stock, that's one thing you would do. Or if you want to take an equity lens to it and look at the areas of the community that are most likely to have housing problems and figure out a compliance system there. But this just feels very random to me uh, in terms of the improvement and the risk of the homeowner not knowing what they're getting into. And what makes that, what makes that whole equation troublesome is um, I'm not really sure what the life safety issues are for illegal bedrooms, and I'm not really sure about the, um, you know, when we start looking at linked smoke detectors, I don't know what the cost of those are, whether that's a physical link that needs to go through the wall, whether that's an electronic link between smoke detectors, don't know what the cost of that is. And against that, what is the background of residential fires resulting in injury that are preventable by that kind of smoke detector? So. I'm really left with an inspection program where I'm wondering what's it trying to accomplish in the broader picture? Well, it's, it's not looking for a full retrofit of any home. I can tell you that. I, um, I get the that. State code doesn't, the Oregon State Code building codes don't require that currently mm -hmm. um, through our authority to uh, look at uh, additional items as allowed by the state program and the city's building official we, we can what we're proposing is this safety inspection which is just to verify that the space intended for the public who has no knowledge of the layout of this home has no history with this home um, that it is going to be seen as a legal space knowing that that legal space could have been legal in 1920 it could have been built and legal in 1960. It could have been built and legal in 1980. And all of those wouldn't meet current code today, perhaps, for mm -hmm. various elements. But they were legal at the time. And the state code absolutely endorses that. that that's, that's a fundamental concept of the state codes, that it's going to, unless you're proposing an alteration, it's going to accept uh, the, the, the code requirements that were uh, put in place at the time of construction. And all we're trying to do is ensure that these spaces are intended, uh, are being used as intended. So when we've seen, um, and I'm sorry if the art, more of an art um, than a science um, misled folks, but we have a difficult spot when we're forced to go in somewhere and we have no records. There's an easy way to deal with that. We could simply say, you know, you can't establish that this is legal. Permits are required. You don't have the permits, and so it's all illegal. And that's not the approach the city takes on these things. And that's where I was trying to get at, that we're trying to use our expertise, our knowledge of historical materials, building practices, to really evaluate these spaces. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you there is an art form there. I mean, my inspectors are well-versed in the technologies, the techniques, the materials, what was common at any given time, um, they can make an assessment whether or not something was legally created this way, if it's been converted. And so we look, we, we just, we have to go in and see what's in front of us. Can we date materials? Can we see the date on that wire? Do we know what the pipe looks like? Um, what's the floorboard? 